The higher you move in your commitment to being the best in the world, the smaller your margin of error. Most of the people I work with know how to handle the weight of failure. They do not know how to handle the weight of success. As long as you're comparing yourself against someone else, you're not the best. When you compare yourself against others, once you're better than everyone, you have no motivation for advancement or improvement. When you're aspiring to greatness, your measurement cannot be another person. The process to greatness is different than you think. The process to greatness is It's not often I hear a new concept that I've never heard ever. I've literally never even heard of That's like a whole new concept to me. What's up, well builders? Today, I got somebody super special on the podcast today. I'm so excited for this man is a mentor to many of the world's top entrepreneurs and you know celebrities. He's got a church just right outside of Hollywood where you wouldn't expect a church, but they're doing some amazing things over there. He's also an expert in communication, has a brand new book coming out. I've got none other than Erwin McManus. What's up, man? Hey, it's good to be here with you. Yeah, you know what's cool is I've heard so much about you from different people um, in the same circle. You know, I had Ed Milet on the show um, I love Ed. a few weeks ago, and he had mentioned you before I even knew you were coming here. Uh -huh. And then um, it just so happened, like everything lined up and I was like, oh, this is cool. So it's good to have you, man. You know, I'm so glad to be here. And I got to tell you, you have such an incredible reputation and everything you're doing, it just really um, reflects well on you and your family. Mm. And just as an outsider, we're just getting to know each other. Yeah. But I started asking people about you and every single person spoke so highly of you. I just want you to know that if you haven't heard any feedback, um, you have a great reputation. People really admire you and they um, talk about you being a great human being. Well, I'm glad they say that. I'm, 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 uh, I guess, you know, it, it's hard to know what people say about you because you don't <laughs> like just go straight up ask people like, mm -hmm. hey, what do you think of me? But uh, <laughs> no, that's great, man. So thank you for that. So for those who are, you know, brand new and who don't know who you are, Tell us a little bit about what you got going on. Well, there's so much going on. Yeah, it's funny. There's thing. a lot. I, I'm 65. Okay. I just turned 65, but I feel like I'm at the beginning of of a whole new adventure in life. You I've got never, like you don't have 65 year old energy. Man, I'm glad because that sounds like near death energy. Yeah, like dude, you're like full of energy. Like look good. Like everything. You know, I think it's about staying curious, um, always reinventing yourself, uh, always exploring. Uh, never becoming satisfied. Yep. And I wake up every morning just so excited to be alive. Mm. Uh, and and I think I've had uh, for decades a really strong sense. I know this is going to sound morbid that um, we all die, and that I do not want to exist. I have no control over the day I die, but I have control over living every single day. Mm. And that for me has been a powerful driver all of my life. When I was around nineteen, I had multiple near death moments. Um, where I was hit head on by a car running across a highway, paralyzed from the waist down. I Whoa. was working construction, fell off a four-story building. And if I'd hit the concrete, I would have been dead. Happened to reach behind me and grab the metal bar that somehow um, I was able to hold on to without tearing my arm, arm out. And I was so aware that I could die. And then I spent 10 years working with drug cartels and gangbangers. And what were most, you doing? Um, you know, I actually, I, like I, when you say you were working with them, were you part of the gang or no, I became, <laughs> I became a person of faith when okay. I was 20 years old and I didn't know why I believed in God. I didn't know how I could trust whether what was written in the Bible was true. Right. And so I thought I need to go, um, see if these principles actually work. And so I thought what would be the most meaningful thing I could do. So I went to the highest crime rate, highest, um, um, murder rate section in the United States at the time in Dallas. And I spent the next 10 years of my life there working with people who were highly underserved, who were um, poor and oppressed and drug addicted and in cartels and underground economies and spent my life there working with people. And I developed this intense um, conviction that there was extraordinary talent and genius and potential inside of every human being. Mm -hmm. And that I could make a huge contribution in the world if I could help people discover it. And I, and I would tell people, you steal because you do not know you can create. Mm. And if I can convince you, you can create. And if I can teach you how to create, you'll never steal again the rest of your life. Mm. And I so that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I, I did when I was younger. And that's a part of the journey uh, that I went on. And, but it was also because 
I'd walk into rooms where oozing machine guns were everywhere, cocaine stacked the ceilings, uh, guys held guns um, in my direction and, um, and telling me they were going to kill me. Wow. And so I became very aware at an early age that life is really fragile. So I decided that I would live my life as if I was fearless. And um, I would use fear to my advantage. Whenever I felt fear, I'd move in that direction. And so people thought I was fearless and that I um, uh, was, was almost unconcerned about death. But the truth was, it wasn't that I wanted to die and it wasn't that I didn't think I could die. It's that I wanted to live fully. And I knew that fear would suck the life out of my soul. Mm. So now at 65, I don't feel like I'm closer to death. I was as close to death at 25 as yeah. I am now. The question is not how close are you to death? It's how close are you to life? Mm. You know, what's funny is I, uh, I kind of say that in a different way when I'm talking to people, because I mean, for me, part of my journey was, you know, playing minor league baseball and not making any money. And, you know, I, I never expected I would have the things I have today. Mm. And so it's like every day I'm just like, very grateful for that. That's beautiful. But it's like, to me, I'm just like living on everything's gravy at this point, you know, <laughs> yeah. because uh, it's, it's already more than I imagined. So everything from here is just, it's great. And that's kind of like what I'm hearing from you is dude, I've already seen it. The worst, like from here on out, it's good. It's all yeah. good. Yeah, so when you ask me what we're creating right now, I'm so excited. I'm excited about this book, Mind Shift. Yep. You don't have to be a genius to think like one. Yep. And, I, and a huge part of it is looking back at my life and realizing that time does not move in a static form. You know, we think of seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks, but really time can move slowly or it can move fast. And I can see times in my life where I felt like I wasn't making any progress. And then there were times in my life I felt like I was accelerating my progress. Right. And I realized that, that my internal frameworks, my mental structures would determine in a sense where I was moving through life at, at a powerful rate or whether I was slowing down and not living out the life I was created to live. Uh, I was in a conversation with these business guys and one guy was telling me about a situation he couldn't solve, an opportunity he couldn't seem to get across. He said, I keep hitting this wall. I keep hitting this wall. I keep hitting this wall. And I told him, I said, all right, I want you to imagine your life on the other side of this wall. I want you to see yourself there. Can you see it? And he goes, yes. And I said, do you want that life? And he paused and he goes, no. And I said, that's because you are the wall. And what I found in life is that most of the time we are the wall. Mm -hmm. We think it's some external circumstance or obstacle or person or the man or institution or the government, whoever. But really, most of the limiting frameworks are mental. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote Mind Shift because I wanted to destroy internal limitations. And I'm really excited about it because I feel like if someone could have given me this book when I was 25 or 35, I could have accelerated into the future I wanted to live in, the future that I was actually, I think, created to live in more rapidly. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're using this word create a lot. And um, it's interesting because I had a, a guest on recently. We were talking about the concept of creating mm -hmm. because for me, every business I've ever started, I created out of thin air. Right. Yeah. And I, I started to talk about why I'm so passionate now about like startup businesses. I also am really, um, passionate about land development. I want to like create out of thin air, this mm -hmm. thing. And you know, this, this faith element of it is like, well, you know, God is our creator. And like, man, if I believe that I have the Holy spirit in me, what am I capable of creating, mm -hmm. you know, here on this earth? And, it just makes you think like that for me anyways, that's what like is so exciting about life is the yeah. ability to create. Yeah. Even as an anthropologist, mm -hmm. if you look at all the species in the world, when I would go to Ted, they would constantly talk about the value of every species. I mean, it could be the, it could be a plant or it could be an insect and you'd have a speaker talking about why this bee matters right. or why, um, you know, this particular nut matters or why this plant matters. And I kept realizing, wow, Every species is talked about with incredible value, except for humans. Mm. And I realized that in some odd way, um, intellectual elitism starts to think that humans don't have value. And so I actually stepped back and asked myself, what makes humans different than every other species? And what humans do that no other species can do is humans materialize the invisible. Humans actually create out of their imagination. Yeah. And what 
in the same way that ants create colonies and bees create hives and beavers create dams, humans create futures. And one of the interesting things to me when I became a person of faith was that I felt like Christians had almost a superstitious view of the future. That, you know, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Or if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. Or, you know, it's almost like a, a fatalistic view of the future. Well, the future is already set. And the reality is that God created humans with the unique gift of creating futures. But you, we do it so naturally, we don't even know the future is coming out of us. The future doesn't come to you. It comes through you. Mm. And when you choose, you're actually creating. So the question isn't whether you can create. The question is, what will you create? Mm. Entrepreneurs, if you want to grow your business, there is no better investment than your own personal brand. The smartest thing I ever did was start creating content and investing into my brand. Ever since then, we've been able to triple our business. I've been able to raise more money than ever to continue buying more real estate. And it's all because I create content just like this. Now, a lot of people have asked me, Ryan, how am I supposed to do it? I don't know where to start. I don't know who's going to edit it. I don't know even what kind of setup or camera or anything to do. Well, here's the thing. We can help you with all of that at Pineda Media. We have a podcast checklist that you can actually get for free at PinedaMedia.com that's going to go over everything you need on starting a podcast. But to make matters even better, we'll actually edit your podcast for you. We'll repurpose it into short form clips like you see on my Instagram and my TikTok so that people will start seeing those clips and watching your podcast and in turn being customers or investors in your business. So, if you want the one-stop solution where you can get everything done for you, plus get the education you need to grow your personal brand, then you need to go to PinedaMedia.com and book a free call with our team. You can also go get that free podcast checklist in that training program, absolutely free by just going there. So go check it out. We probably don't know the answer to this, but I'd be curious, like your opinion is people, I, I have seen a lot of Christians do that where mm -hmm. it's like, well, you know, they, you know, the whole predestination yeah. thing. And it's like, well, you know, it's... God has already predestined what I'm going to do, you know? And then it's like, well, do you even have this freedom of, you know, uh, free will and, mm -hmm. and all these things? And it's like, from what I hear from you, it's like, I mean, how do you come to this concept of if God is omniscient and all knowing mm -hmm. and everything else, but we have free will, is it that he knows what we're going to choose to do, but it's still in our control of what we're doing? Ironically, Calvinism and scientific atheism are actually brothers. Mm. They have the same view of reality. Okay. Scientific atheism believes that the universe is mathematical and that decisions are illusions, that humans are actually do not decide, that we are simply mathematical constructs and what we do has already been predetermined. So scientific atheism actually has a deterministic view of reality, that everything is already set. The math is already set. It's the exact same view of predestination. Yeah. That everything's already set. And so I, I remember looking at one of the national conferences on scientific atheism where they talked about there was no creativity, no free will, and no spirituality. Because mm -hmm. all of those things are implicit if you're created by God. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is amazing um, because I always thought it would be only the Calvinists who believed that there was no free will. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if there's no free will, there's no creative act. There's no creativity. And ironically, if there's no free will, there's actually no spirituality because spirituality comes out of our dynamic ability to respond to love. Mm. And one of the things that I just absolutely believe is that um, for, let's say for anything to exist with God, Free will isn't necessary. You know, when people say, well, you know, we're really here to glorify God. Well, if God only wants to be glorified, free will isn't necessary. Right. The only reason free will is necessary is love. Because you love cannot exist without freedom. Yeah. You can't be forced to love somebody. If you're forced to love, it isn't love. Yeah. And 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 I and I absolutely believe that you that love is the driving principle of the universe. That God in his essence is love mm -hmm. and that everything is a reflection of God's dynamic, complete love. Yeah. Which is why I have such strong convictions on free will, but it's also why I believe in the creative act. It, you know, it's funny when you just reduce it. I, I remember I'd be in meetings and people would say, I mean, there'd be nobody in the room and they'd go, well, everyone that God wanted here is here. And I'm like, 
No, I think you just did terrible marketing. <laughs> you know, I just, I just yeah. think you're really bad at what you do yeah, yeah. and you shouldn't blame God for that. And by the way, I've had this <laughs> argument too with people where, um, you know, I, I had this argument with a guy in Bible study many years ago and he's like, well, you know, like people should be here. And I'm like, no, like it's our job to like present the message and, mm -hmm. you know, do a great job attracting people in the door. Like, yeah, God's going to work. But like, we have also, you know, like the obligation to do our very best to like make an amazing church, market it effectively, spread the word. Why else would you need to evangelize if you didn't have to do anything? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I didn't know if we we're going to go down this rabbit hole, but I told someone maybe the worst song that's ever been written is Jesus Take the Wheel. Yeah. And if you say Jesus Take the Wheel, no one's holding the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that God designed you to actually take the wheel. Right. And one of the problems of many times, and, and maybe it's because I grew up irreligious, is that when I came to faith, I thought, why are Christians so passive? Right. And why do they have such a fatalistic view of the future? Yeah. See, people who do not believe in God do not wait for permission to create. But people who do believe in God keep thinking that only God creates. And I actually think that God created us all to create. Mm -hmm. And that I would rather have proactive people who have deep faith, who want to do good in the world going, no, I'm designed to create a better world. I'm right. designed to create a better future. And it's my moral responsibility to be creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's our responsibility to use the gifts we've been given to, to build mm -hmm. the kingdom. And it's interesting because like you were talking about the concept of free will mm -hmm. and a lot of people have, you know, had this debate. Well, okay, well, why did God even let you know, sin enter the world. Why did Eve eat the apple? It's like, well, you know, if, if they were just robots and they had no choice and no free will, it's like, there, there's no love. There's nothing. There's nothing. Yeah. It's like asking the question, why is there darkness? You know, and you, you can't have light if there isn't darkness. Right. And, and darkness isn't something that actually exists. Our darkness is just the absence of light. Yeah. And in the same way, when people talk about, you know, well, how can there be sin in the world? Well, if human beings did not have free will, then there wouldn't be any capacity to live beneath your capacity. And, you know, as long as I have the potential to achieve great things, I have the potential to not achieve them. Is this the, the concept of duality that people talk about? Yeah, I, I think it's because we try to understand things that um, are so complex and there are questions we have to ask yeah, uh, but but the truth is, um, even if you don't believe in God, there is there is creativity and there's destruction. Yeah, there's hate and there's love. Even if you don't believe in God, yeah, there, there's suffering and there's healing. Those dualities all exist. Mm -hmm. And so the, the the question for me really becomes, uh, what's the source of all that? One time someone said to me, "I don't believe in God because there's so much suffering in the world." That's how I know God doesn't exist. And I go, well, okay, God doesn't exist. Is there still suffering in the world? <laughs> and they go, well, yes. And I said, so who's responsible now? Yeah. And I go, well, we are. I said, now, if we're, if we're responsible for the suffering and there's no God, is it possible there is a God? And he's really upset mm. that we have allowed so much suffering, that this is beneath our intention. Human beings are the only species that can live beneath their intention. You will never see a beaver create a bridge it will only create a dam. Silkworms will only create silk, never polyester. Mm. Humans are the only species that can actually subvert their intention. And there are two subtle ways or words that I think um, let us see this. One is, have you ever heard the phrase like, well, that's just inhumane? Yeah. We say it's inhumane when a human does it. But how can it be inhumane if a human does it? Because when a tiger eats a gazelle, we don't go, that's inanimal. You know, when a killer whale eats a seal, we don't think, we don't call that evil. Right. But we can actually identify that when a human being acts like an animal, that it's inhumane. It's beneath our humanity. And even we talk about something being unnatural. I remember um, my wife and I were driving through, I think, Arkansas and there were all these trees and we were being really quiet. And I broke the silence when I said, look at all of this undeveloped land. <laughs> and my wife started yelling at me. She's a farm girl yeah. from North Carolina. This is not undeveloped land. These are trees <laughs> and God created trees. And I said, well, honey, if there's no God, then cities are just our beehives. 
<laughs> if there's no God, cities are just ant colonies. Why would we call concrete? Why would why do we call what we create not nature? It's because somehow humans know that we are transcendent, not simply trapped in nature. Right. But somehow outside of nature and inside of nature. And I think that our language actually betrays us. We know that humans are created for more than simply to be a part of the natural order. Right. And I think it's because of the image of God in us. And we have human ideals. I mean, Ryan, even people who don't believe in God want things like world peace. Yeah. Want a world with justice, want to end poverty, want to end homelessness, want to create a world where people actually have opportunity. Where do these ideals come from? You know, one of the things I, I loved studying was phantom pain that um, I think it's an unusual phenomenon that you can, you experience phantom pain when you lose a limb. And for years, you feel that limb being there. You really? actually experience the pain of that limb. Mm. You can only have phantom pain if you lose something that once belonged to you. Okay. I'm absolutely convinced ideals are the phantom pain of the soul. The reason we're driven for a world with peace, we've never known a world with peace. Why do we even have that concept? We've never known a human history with justice. So why do we imagine a world with justice? We've never known a world without poverty. Even Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. Mm -hmm. So why do we imagine a world where there's no poverty? I think it's because we have this phantom pain of the soul. We know that the human experience is not supposed to be like this, mm. that we were created to be a, the kind of humanity that reflects the beauty and goodness of God. And we're living beneath our potential. I love that. I, I mean, I, I got to say, it's not often I hear a new concept that I've never heard ever. Because, you know, <laughs> typically you'll, you might hear something from somebody or maybe, mm -hmm. especially if it's a, um, uh, a church related thing. And you're like, yeah, I mean, I heard that in service, maybe, but like, I've literally never even heard of phantom pain. That's like a whole <laughs> new concept to me. And then to think and revert it back to, well, yeah, I mean, there was a time where humans existed before sin entered the world. And there was mm -hmm. a time when, you know, the things that we desire, mm -hmm. um, existed. Yeah. Right. And so that's, that's, that is a good concept that I'm going to really stew on. <laughs> even think about human relationships. Every child wants a father who loves them. Right. And a mother who loves them. And we grow up with the pain and trauma of imperfect parents. But the reality is that every human being is imperfect. Right. So why is it that our souls are actually designed for a level of love that human beings seem incapable of giving? Yeah. See, I think it's because our souls know what humanity is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. And whenever we have an experience beneath that, it actually devastates us and even breaks us or even shatters us. Yeah. But really, our experience should be, yeah, there really isn't unconditional love out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We should never expect it. Right. And yet, even when we don't experience it, we still long for it. Mm -hmm. But then when you do experience it from a parent, it's like a taste of heaven, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, your spouse. You know, I'm yeah. like, dude, I screwed up really bad. I don't know <laughs> how you're going <laughs> to forgive me and love me for that, but I'm glad you do, mm -hmm. you know? But our souls know, oh, this is what life is supposed to be. Well, I mean, we also have the Bible telling yeah. us what life was like and what it is supposed to yeah. be. Just most of the people I talk to don't believe in the Bible. Yeah. So I actually spend a great deal of my time trying to point to principles and truths without even using the Bible so a person can see this is actually true for everyone. Wealth Builders, if you are trying to grow your real estate investing business, then you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. You have no idea what Wealthy Investor is. It is our coaching program and community. We have helped thousands of students worldwide grow their business. Now, it doesn't matter if you're just getting started and you're trying to get that first deal. We can help you do that. If you're trying to scale your business and go from a few deals a year to a few deals a month or even seven figures a year, we can help you do that too. In fact, last year alone, we had over 30 students do over a million dollars in revenue. And I'd love for you to be the next one. So it's pretty simple. If you're trying to grow your business and wholesale more homes or flip more homes or buy more rental properties, then you need to go to wealthyinvestor.com and book a free call with our team. It's super simple. We'll go on a strategy call with you and figure out how we can help you grow according to your needs. So 
All you got to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com, book the free call with the team, and we'll see you there. We we dove straight into the faith aspect. You know? We did. I thought yeah. we were talking about business. Yeah, or- yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> I, for me anyways, mm-hmm. I I know that your background is obviously you're a pastor, but you're also a businessman. You're an mm-hmm. entrepreneur. Like, you know, what you're doing is fusing the secular world with, you know, like you just pretty much mm-hmm. what you just did, right? Yeah. You're like, I mean, whether you believe or not, like yeah. why? You got to still answer these questions of why mm-hmm. do we feel the way we feel? And um I think it's amazing because beforehand we were just talking about like, well, you know, I'm not like one of these guys who's going to be like overtly Christian-y, right? Like yeah. I want to, you know, go reach the secular world and talk to those people. And you're telling me like at your church on Easter, you had like over a thousand atheists attend. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that's amazing. Like that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. I, I think some of it is, um, I'm actually more of a philosopher. Yeah. And um, for whatever reason, from my earliest age, I was traumatized with a sense of meaninglessness. And uh, I started searching for meaning in life probably by the age of six or seven years old. Wow. And my family didn't know what to do with me. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, at six years old, <laughs> why, why am I here? And by the time I was 10, I was in a psychiatric chair. Wow. And I spent you know six months in and out of a hospital with psychosomatic uh, illnesses. And, um, and I started disconnecting from, you know, reality from the real world around me. So I understand what it feels like to go through massive internal trauma. And, um, and, and I, I read every mythology book in the library by the time I was 12 years old. And I started reading uh, physicists and science fiction writers like Isaac Asinoff and Robert Heinlein and Ray Bradbury when I was nine, 10 years old. And I was just searching for meaning in life. And, 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 you know, Ryan, this didn't come because of religion. It didn't come because of a belief system I was given. Right. There was just something in my soul that said, you know, there's gotta be a reason we're here. There's gotta be a reason we exist. And I think these are things that are true to being human. They're intrinsic. They drive us. And, and you know, even like you can keep it superficial. It's the reason why people wanna have more money and more things and more power and more fame is they're trying to find some way to prove that their life matters. Mm-hmm. They're trying to find some way to prove that that their existence wasn't just wasted, and and I, and, that, and for me, it's really important to help people realize, hey, all the stuff that you can do in your life, it's all wonderful, but what you need to do is get to the core of what's driving you, mm. because that's where you're going to find the healing and the health that you really need. So, what do you think drives you? What did you discover? I think every human being has three basic intrinsic needs. Uh, one is a need for intimacy. Every human being needs to be loved. And we try to find it in different ways and different um, expressions. Sometimes it's, you know, romantic love, but it's not just that. Like sometimes you need a, a band of brothers. Yeah. You know, sometimes you need a family, a community, a tribe. It's why um, kids join gangs is because uh, having a family, having an identity is um, so intrinsic to who we are. It's why people become fans of teams like the Raiders. Yep, it's because yep. you have to have some place you belong, your community, your identity. Join a frat. Yeah, all of us have a need to be loved, to have intimacy. We all have a need to find meaning or to give meaning to life. Human beings are meaning machines. Mm. Everything we do is an expression of meaning. The way you cut your hair, the clothes you choose, it all is an expression of the meaning of your life. And what's crazy about us as human beings is that even what we're doing right now, I am making sounds and somehow in the space between us, those sounds are being translated in your brain as words. And so I'm making sounds that translate into meaning in your brain, but I could change languages. I hablo español y puedo expresarme en otro idioma y quizás me puedes entender, quizás no me puedes entender. And so if I change the language, now the sounds are just sounds. Yeah. And they don't translate meaning. Well, I've think, had a little Duolingo, so right, maybe a little go. bit. You know, or, you know, I yeah, mean, yeah. There, there were tribes in Africa yeah. that speak through clicking. Yep. And I don't know what I said. I hope it wasn't offensive. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and what it is, we, have, we are meaning machines. We talk about feng shui. The way we organize things is meaning. Colors have meaning. Colors actually communicate meanings to us. Our physicality has meaning. Humans are meaning machines. And we'll spend our whole life trying to make sense of our life. And then we have a drive. We also have a need for progress. Human beings need to become. We all need to be to belong, to be loved. We all need to believe, to find meaning, and we all need to become. And that's why, Ryan, no matter how much you accomplish, 
that will not help you tomorrow. No. Tomorrow you're going to wake up and go, who do I become now? What do I do now? What do I accomplish now? Where, where am I going now? Mm -hmm. Human beings have this compulsive need to move forward. The moment you do not believe that tomorrow can be better than today or that you can be better than you are, you will move to despair. Yes. And so I look at these three human intrinsics, our need to become, our need to belong, and our need to believe. And by the way, they come straight from the Bible. It's why Paul says that the highest virtues are faith, hope, and love. Because hope is something very rare. It only exists in the future. Hope cannot exist in the past. Yeah. And so as long as a human being has hope, they're always, they always have the drive to keep moving forward. As long as a person has love, they always have a sense of meaning and identity. And as long as a person has faith in something, they always can bring meaning to life. You don't stop believing in God because um, someone convinced you there's no God. You stop believing in God because you couldn't make sense of the pain in your life. You lost hope. And you lose hope. Yeah. yeah. No, that's really good. I think um, it's funny because in the business world, and you, you mentor a lot of these guys, and well, before yeah. people have made it, they think, oh, when I hit a certain net worth mark or certain amount mm -hmm. of properties or revenue and, you know, all have arrived and, you know, they, they have this dream of financial freedom and retiring on the beach and everything. I'm like, okay, like it ain't going to like fulfill you. I mean, yeah. you're, you're still going to be empty if you're empty today. Like it, nobody today, regardless of your circumstance has to be empty and full of despair, you know, like it, your circumstance doesn't really matter. I mean, we were just literally reading Philippians four today in Bible study and Paul's in jail talking mm -hmm. about, man, you know, in every situation, you know, I've learned to become content. Doesn't matter the circumstance. I'm good. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is a guy who had status and everything you can imagine and gave it all up to go do something else and, yeah. and preach the gospel and, and do it in jail for no reason. You know, one of the stories I talk about in my new book, um, and I, I didn't go into deep detail, but I was asked to speak at a, an event that was hosted by this billionaire. And I could tell when I got there, he didn't really want me to speak. Mm. He only wanted billionaires speaking. Mm. I did not qualify. <laughs> and, uh, and, but one of the guys that he worked with convinced him to have me as a keynote. So when I got there, he was pretty cold and, you know, wasn't really responsive to me before I spoke. And then when I spoke, something shifted and he, uh, his wife was a member of Mensa and um, super, super uh, interesting. And, and he came and we were sitting at the table and he goes, you know, you, you, you remind me a lot of my wife and the way she thinks. And, and he started asking me some questions and I, and I looked at him, I said, Hey, I, I know this is your event and I know we don't know each other. And I know that, you know, you have billions but my sense is that you are hollow and that there's an emptiness that's eating you up alive. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if whatever it's worth, you don't have to go through that alone. And maybe if I'm wrong, you can just ignore it. So I, I leave and he follows me out to the parking lot and he starts opening up his life and he starts talking to me about how, you know, he is just falling apart internally. And I said, Hey, I, I can help you. Like, if you'll just open up your life, we can go on a journey together. I can help you. And he he texted me just a few minutes later in the car and he just said, Never mind, never mind. <laughs> uh, I, I got this. I got this. And within two months, he killed himself. Wow. And here you have a guy who has billions of dollars at all success. I don't even think he was 40 yet. And it just it was just a reminder to me that you can't succeed yourself out of the pain in your inner world mm -hmm. and you have to deal with the internal structures most of the people i work with know how to handle the weight of failure they do not know how to handle the weight of success mm. and i and i think that's where so much of the important conversations are because when i talk to people on sundays at mosaic a lot of times when you're dealing with just every day like you know church life and people in their own personal journeys you're helping a lot of people deal with the weight of failure. But when you're dealing with people who are at this different level of living and their execution, now they're dealing with the weight of success. Right. And someone asked me earlier, what's 
the huge difference I see with the people I coach is that they have almost zero margin for error. When you're shooting for average, you have a massive margin for error. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so they don't need a coach. That's why average people don't need coaches. Yeah, they're already there. Yeah, and don't want to if you're trying to move to being pretty good, you, you need a coach, but you don't have to have a coach. You can get pretty good on your own. But if you notice anyone who's in the arena of greatness, I mean, Novak has a coach. Rafa has a coach. You know, the, the best athletes in the world have coaches. Kobe had multiple coaches. And they'll have performance coaches and mindset coaches and technique coaches. And it's because the higher you move in your commitment to being the best in the world, the, the smaller your margin of error. And, and when someone asks me, what's the difference between who I work with is I mostly work with people who have almost zero margin of error. And it's so stressful. And, and the weight of it is, is it can be almost um, so consuming. And a huge part of it a lot of times is walking people through going, even if the worst case scenario happens, you're going to be okay. You know, and it, it's just about stepping back. And I just did a talk recently on, um, on the singularity. And so I was on a coaching call today and someone's going through a pretty massive crisis and he happened to listen to this talk on singularities. And because I've been really interested in this whole concept of, of in physics, that, that there is going to be a break point where like, like AI develops consciousness and now they're more superior than us. And, what, and the singularity is about really what will be the evolution of humans. And I actually have this, uh, sense that when you enter into a relationship with back to Jesus for me, but with Jesus, you enter in what's called the singularity because the Bible actually says that not only do you live here, but you're also seated in the heavenlies. So now you are a multidimensional creature. And I told him, I said, look, when I'm in a crisis, I don't tell myself I'm going to get through this. I tell myself I'm already through this. Mm. And, uh, and, I step back and I decide I'm not going to look at life from the most minute place. I'm going to look at life from the transcendent place. Right. And I'm already through this. I've already overcome this. Mm. I've already solved this problem. Yeah. And I'm on the other side of this. I get the joy of experiencing the pressure of it. I, I love what they put at uh, the U S open. When you walk in, it says, uh, pressure is a privilege. Hmm. I love that sign. Like what I get right now in this life is the privilege of pressure. Yeah. Of um, testing out my faith, discovering how much courage I have, becoming more creative and inventive. Every problem gives me an opportunity to discover something about myself. And I think that's the fun part, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I'm glad life isn't easy. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that there are real challenges and real obstacles you have to overcome. And, uh, and, but for me, the perspective difference is um, I'm going through it and I've been through it and I've already overcome it. Mm. No, I love it, man. I, uh, it's interesting, man, because I grew up in the church. So faith has always been a part of my life. And so mm -hmm. dealing with struggles and failures and trauma and everything else, like I've always had like a foundation to mm. go back on. And I think about, all the things I've had to go through in my life. And I'm just like, man, it's, I'm so lucky that I knew that it just wasn't me, that I didn't have to figure this out on my own and get through this. But to what you said, it's already done. Like mm -hmm. Jesus paid the price. I'm like, I already know where I'm going to be in eternity. So whatever trials and tribulations I'm going through now, it's small. Mm -hmm. And in the grand scheme of eternity, like this, this time on earth is, minuscule yeah and so you know once you like have that kind of perspective mm -hmm. it changes how you perceive the world and the problems and you're like why am i tripping because we had a bad month why am yeah. i tripping because this guy left why am i tripping because i didn't get this opportunity yeah yeah i had a day where i lost a company that was worth about six to ten million dollars so i lost you know up to ten million dollars in an afternoon yeah uh, it crushed me and I ended up uh, taking a million dollar loan on my house just, just to finish projects um, because of a decision a business partner made where they took the whole company. Mm. And, um, and I couldn't eat for like 30 days. 
I lost, I, I got down to 169 pounds, which for me was really thin. Mm. It was a great way to lose weight <laughs> and but not recommended. Yeah. And, uh, and in that moment, I felt so crushed. I had to fly home, sit down with my wife, Kim, who was an orphan, who grew up in a foster home from the age of eight to 18, and look at my wife and say, I lost everything. And I looked at Kim, buying her a cup of coffee I could no longer afford. And I said, I lost everything. And Kim said, I thought I was your everything. Mm. How old are you? Uh, I was, you know, oh my gosh, I was 50. Wow. Yeah, or so. And um, and when she said, I was, uh, I thought I was your everything, I thought, who is this person? Who answers like that? Yeah. And I, I didn't have a, a noble answer. I said, well, I lost my other everything. <laughs> that finances my everything. And, I lost a lot. <laughs> and, and, and the reason I, I shared this is that in that moment, it felt like I, I could never overcome this. Right. It was just absolutely devastating. And five years later, I kept praying and going, oh God, you know, just could you just drop like a million dollars on me to help me solve this problem? <laughs> and he never did. And, you know, he never did. Never did. <laughs> you know, and five years later, I came out of all of that. And what I learned in that is I wanted God to meet me in faith, but he met me in faithfulness. And when I came out of that, I thought, wow. I had the capacity to lose $10 million and not be destroyed by it, not be crushed by it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was capable of this much. Yeah. Man, my capacity to risk increased so much. And I, I had the privilege of losing that much money. Right. Very few people have that opportunity. Yeah. You know? yeah. And um, I'm more unstoppable now yeah. because now I know how much I can actually go through yeah. and still come out ahead on the other side. Yeah. I think I, most people never get to learn that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I've, I've brought this up before where I remember in 2018, um, I had 70 house flips going on. And mm. at that time, the, they raised rates, not, not to the rates they mm -hmm. have done recently, but it caused the market to shift and, and slow down. And it was the winter and all this stuff. And I ran into a cash crunch. I had all these properties and running out of cash. And I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, what the heck do I do? Like, here's my overhead. Here's mm -hmm. our payments. And I totally mismanaged this money, like unintentionally. Like I just didn't realize like, you know, money that was supposed to be used for construction. I was buying more properties with and like, mm -hmm. you know, just young mistakes. And really what happened was I was like, man, this is like really my first million dollar problem. And I have to figure out how to solve it. And obviously I got through it and, you know, it made a, a lot of changes from that. And it made me so much better the coming years. And then, you know, I ended up with my first $10 million problem. <laughs> and it's like, man, how am I going to solve this? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I remembered while I was solving that was, you know, remember how big the million dollar problem was, right? You got through that. All right. You're, you're at a different scale now, right? If you want to do big things, you're going to get a hundred million dollar problem at some point. And how are you going to solve that? If you can't solve a 10 million, how can you solve a hundred million? And to me, it goes back to, you know, there are people who they freak out over a hundred dollar problem, right? Because <laughs> it's a super big deal to them, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just like, dude, if you can't solve a hundred dollar problem, Ain't no way in the world you can solve a thousand dollar problem or a hundred thousand dollar problem. And so to your point, it's like, man, yeah, like it's actually, yo, I get to deal with a really big problem mm -hmm. and see what my capacity is made of. Yeah. You know, the flip side is also true with generosity. Uh, w when Kim and I were first married, we slept on the floor because we couldn't afford a bed. But um, because we were both people of deep faith, we gave minimally 10% of our income, which was almost nothing. Yep. You know, for about 10 years, I never made more than 12,000 a year. I think my average income for about those 10 years, about 8,000 a year, total package. Yeah. And so we were just really raking in that money, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, but, you know, out of that 8,000, we were tithing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then we were probably a couple that gave more like 20, 25% of our income. And when we were making 25,000, we were giving 20, percent or more mm -hmm. and we made and people always say well you know when i get rich that's when i'm gonna be generous <laughs> no chance and i go not a chance man. <laughs> if you don't learn how to be generous when you're poor you're gonna hold down that money and i know billionaires who give tens of thousands of dollars 
Yeah. And because they're so worried about losing what they have. Yeah. And and so they're they're generous in in ratio, but not actually like in scale in terms of of what they could really give. Well, they're not even generous in ratio. They're just generous in volume. Yeah, this is what I mean volume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like it looks like a lot, right? Yeah. Because it's more than we make in a year. Yeah. And uh, but there's no risk in it. No, no, it's it's yeah. not really generous. And and I think that's it, that's why it's true in both ways. Like you discover how much how big of problems you can take on. Yeah. But also like early on, you also begin to discover or decide what kind of generosity you want to have in your life. Yeah. And um, I, for me, I was the same way, you know, part of my story was I was a minor league baseball player. And so I made 7,000 a year. So somehow less. Wow. You're crushing it. I was killing it. Right. And I got married young <laughs> yeah. and my wife was 21 in, in college. And so she wasn't working and that was our income. Hmm. And like you, I was a generous tither. Well, not a generous. I was a minimum tither, yeah. but you know, doing it nonetheless off no money. And, um, you know, I just faithfully always did it. And then, you know, as I made more, it became like the next test of, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you more and let's see how generous you are now. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I ever had to write a $20,000 or not, not a 20, I made 20 and I had to write a $2,000 check, like on mm -hmm. one of these house flips. And I was like, whoa, this is a big check to write. And I remember like the test of faith where God's like, really? Like, I just gave you the most money you've, <laughs> and you're like now mm -hmm. saying you, you're not sure. And I was convicted. I was like, yeah. dude, what am I doing? And then so boom, you do it. Yeah. And then, you know, from there, um, I'm not going to say I was always like, uh, perfect. There was always like, uh, ah, well, you know, times are tough and you know, th there's always some excuse, but you know, maybe I could take this money and buy another deal. And then I can give way more later down the road. Yeah. Like you, you'll make all these excuses. And then it just became apparent to me. I'm just like, nope, every month, whatever it is, it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. And it just becomes a habit. It also works really beautifully the other way around in that uh, the word generosity comes from the same word as being generative. And I always tell people, you can't actually achieve your full potential of being generous if you're not deciding to be generative. What is generative? It means you're creating wealth. Mm, okay. Yeah, because if you have the capacity to create great wealth, but you choose to create less, you're actually stealing because you've been given by God this capacity yes. to be really generative, to generate a lot of wealth yeah. so that you could be more generous. Correct. And when Kim and I, Aaron and Mariah were really young and we were making about 35,000 a year combined, we're living in LA, which was brutal. And um, I got a contract or an offer to write a book. And, but right before that, our, the church we were going to was doing this campaign. And so my wife, I, I told her, I said, I think we should give $25,000. Our income was 35,000. <laughs> that, that's generous. And my wife, who's very competitive said, I, why not 30,000? Oh. And, it, and I said, oh, okay, we, we have a commitment that we always go with the highest um, faith. <laughs> and uh, so we made a commitment for 30,000, had no idea how we're going to give it. I get a call. You did a talk at this event. Can you turn that into a book? And I said, send me a contract. And I was 40 years old and they sent me a contract for $25,000. Wow. So I, I was right. But uh, <laughs> so I had never written a book and I didn't know if I could write it. And I, I was trying to write this book, but I couldn't type. And I, I had 20, maybe 20 pages. All of a sudden, this woman walks up to me at the nightclub we were meeting in as a church. And she said, I work for Sidney Sheldon. He's written like 40 novels. And uh, he talks all of his books in. I'm a sonographer. I heard you're trying to write a book. Maybe you could talk your book in and I could just type it. Yeah. And she types as fast as a person can talk. Wow. So I would drive out to Palm Springs where Sidney lived. And when she got off of work, she would meet me and I would type two or three hours. I would talk two or three hours a day. She yeah. would type. I wrote my first book in 24 hours. <laughs> it actually won an award. Wow. And we got a check. And I, I said, don't give me the advance. Uh, wait till I finish the book. Cause I didn't know if I could, I finished the book. They sent me a check for $25,000. We held it in our living room for like five minutes. Then we gave it to the church. Mm -hmm. I would have never written that book. And then it became a writer and sold over a million copies of my books. And, um, I would have never become a writer if we had not made that commitment to give away $30,000. But because I decided to be generous, we decided to be generous, I had to become generative. 
And so now I'm generating, I'm taking talent and ability that I was going to leave unused. Mm. But because I made a commitment to be more generous than I seemed capable of, now I had to match it by becoming more generative. So I look at Mosaic and I go, you know, Mosaic is in the middle of Hollywood. Hollywood gives no money, let me tell you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Kim and I have been the biggest givers in our church for most of the 30 years we've been there. Mm. And we look and go, okay. Our this is budget, coming from all your entrepreneurial endeavors. Yeah. And, yeah. And I go, okay, we're going to be about a million dollars behind in our budget. So then I go, oh, great. That means I have to be generative and create millions of dollars so that I can give a million dollars. Yeah. Because I would rather work and create a million dollars than go ask people to give a million dollars. Correct. And, and, and it drives me and motivates me and inspires me. Yeah. And I think, so it works the other way around. It's not just being generous because, you know, you're being faithful. Yeah. It's realizing in some ways it motivates you to be more creative, to be more inventive, to be more generative. And so that you can actually be more generous. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think, you know, in, in the Bible, there's the parable of the talents and, mm -hmm. and, you know, God giving, you know, money to everyone based on their skill. And he's like, hey, you're going to manage five, you're going to manage two, you're managing mm -hmm. one. And, you know, the guy with five turns it to 10, the guy mm -hmm. with two turns it to four, the guy with one buries it. <laughs> and like, mm -hmm. you know, he's scared. He can't manage yeah. the money. And, you know, he ends up giving the one to the 10. By the way, it's the only time that I can think of where in a very specific way, Jesus says, you're wicked. Mm. Like if I buried a talent and gave it back to God, you would think that would just be maybe uninventive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? you were just, or, you, you were too cautious. Yeah, you were being passive. Yeah. Jesus actually calls wicked not maximizing the God-given talent and potential that's inside of you. Mm -hmm. Because what God has placed inside of you is not a gift to you. It's supposed to be a gift to the world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, don't bury your talent, whatever it is. Yeah. Because Jesus goes, you lazy, wicked servant. Yeah. And, and I'm like, man, um, we, we look at like wickedness as what are the things you're doing wrong? But what Jesus says, no, when you don't do the good you should be doing, that's when it's a real problem. Right. When you're capable of more and you don't, you don't utilize it. Yeah. This kid graduated from UCLA and he goes, I don't know what to do with my life now. And I said, um, what, do you, what do you mean? Like, you know, uh, he goes, well, you know, to pay the bills. And I go, you just graduated from UCLA. Your parents put hundreds of thousands of dollars for you to get this degree. And all you want to do is pay the bills. <laughs> like you should be asking, how do I create millions of dollars so I could help a thousand people have a salary so I could help 5,000 families. So I could help children go to private schools or get a good education. You are a uniquely entitled individual who has the opportunity to do so much good it would be tragic if all you did was get a job to pay the bills. Right. And I actually think that's why I admire you, right? And it's like, I admire people who go, I could get a really good job and make enough money to take care of me and my family. Or I could take massive risks, mm -hmm. even take massive criticism and create more than even I thought was possible so that I could do more good than I could have ever imagined. Right. I think we need more people who actually choose to create so they can actually do more good. I think the problem is, you know, people live with so much fear. Yes. And they're like, oh, I don't know if taking this risk is like, you know what? My life's not terrible the way it is, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think people get so caught up in, I would say it's just selfish. I mean, at the end of the day, the fact that you you might not want to take risk because you're not scared of work or not. And you're just, I guess like, yeah, you know what? Like my life's fine the way it is. I mean, to me, it's just selfish thinking. Yeah. I, when your life is driven by fear, you are a prisoner in such a small world. One of the things I learned early on is that whatever you fear establishes the boundaries of your freedom. Mm -hmm. So if you're afraid of heights, you stay low. If you're afraid of people, you stay alone, you know? And, and if you're afraid of, of risk, you stay secure. And one of the interesting things to me is, uh, I think, and early on in my life, it just made this commitment that I would use fear to my advantage. That whenever I was afraid, I was going to move hard and fast in that direction. 
And, you, you know, and I look back on my life now and I realize, oh, wow, so many people think I was full of courage. They don't realize I had as much fear as they did. Yeah. I just used fear to my advantage. And, and I, I love graphic novels. And in my back house, I have all these comic books and, and I have all these posters of Daredevil everywhere. And one of the reasons I loved Daredevil was that he was a man without fear. Mm. And and even when I was a, a kid, I just decided I'm going to time to take on Daredevil's persona. <laughs> and uh, he was blind. You, you know, he had uh, he had what other people saw as a limitation, but he had invisible superpowers that no one could ever imagine. And so I just, in a sense, took on that persona. I thought, hey, other people may not see talent in me, but I have hidden unknown superpowers, and I'm going to make my superpower being fearless. I have no control over how much talent I have. I have nope. no control over really how much intelligence I have. I have no control over how tall I am or how good looking I am. I, that's all, you know, outside of my control. I have control over how much integrity I have. I have control of how much courage I have. I have control of um, how I will deal with fear and whether I will let fear limit my life or I will use fear as my compass that says, no, that's my next territory to take over. Yeah. And, and I think that's the thing I would encourage people is how can you have faith and be defined by fear? I mean, they're, they're opposites. It's duality. Yeah. So how does somebody break free of fear and, and develop courage? Because, you know, we're talking about these other aspects of mm -hmm. life. Hey, well, I was born talented and, yeah. you know, this and that and this. And it's like, well, those things play into confidence and courage and everything else actually when you build your confidence on talent you become arrogant mm. confidence is actually built on discipline okay i can resonate with that not on talent and so what happens with a, a world level athletes you can see them some of them are so talented that all of their confidence is based on their talent and so they fracture under pressure. But the greatest athletes like Novak and Rafa, uh, like Steph Curry, like they actually put their confidence on their discipline, their hard work, and their commitment to details. Their preparation. Their preparation. And one of the things I was able to discover in my life was, because I never felt talented enough, and I think it was an incredible gift. In fact, I write in the book about the curse of talent. If you're incredibly talented when you're young, you have a tendency to have built your confidence on your talent. So when the talent is no longer enough, you actually have a crisis of identity. And talented people usually don't have to build the internal structures for success. People will build structures around you when you have talent, which is why most pro football players, 75% of them within five years after their career is over are divorced, bankrupt, dead, or drug addicted. Yeah. And it's because external structures were placed on their life so that people could take advantage of their talent. Right. When you, when you have the gift that I had, no obvious talent at all. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with no talent. I had to figure it out. I had a brother who was like the fastest kid in the United States in sixth grade. Whoa. He was a college, he, he, was, he was the quarterback in high school that broke all the conference passing records. He's also a genius. And we were in the same grade because my mom thought it was easier to put us in school together. So he was seven, I was five. And I thought we were twins, but I was the anemic, untalented twin. <laughs> and so what I had was I had no external structures for success. I had to build internal structures. Mm -hmm. When you actually build your confidence on your discipline, on your preparation, on your character, it becomes unshakable. Right. And because it's not based on your talent. And then when you discover you might have some talent, you know, and, you know, cause I look back now on my life and I go, wow, people actually think I have talent because they've mistaken my hard work for talent. Yeah. They've mistaken my person. And it's funny now, I mean, I get introduced to places and people go, Erwin McManus is a savant or he's a genius or he's a, a polymath. And I'm going, I barely graduated high school. I had to beg the principal to graduate <laughs> me from high school. Yeah. Difference was that perseverance starts looking like genius. Hmm. And because when you resolve to not quit, you learn things that can only be learned in the crucible of discipline and resilience. Yeah. And you suddenly look like a genius because you didn't quit. Yeah. Let me, let me add to this and edify because for me, 
obviously growing up an athlete, um, mm -hmm. I was always good. I was always one of the best, if not the best coming up. Right. So I was one of those guys who, um, didn't have to face adversity. I mean, like just yeah. you're moving up, crushing it. Eventually, you know, you reach a level in sports where you're now no longer going to get by with talent. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think for me that happened around college and I was like, wow, I mean, all these guys are very talented. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm looking around, I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm going to have to outwork these guys and have more discipline. And, you know, you go get drafted. Then you get to the pros and you're like, holy crap, these guys are way more talented. Yeah. These guys run faster, throw farther, hit it further. Everything about it, natural talent wise, they're better. And you start to realize like, man, dude, how do you, how do you beat that? Yeah. And the answer is discipline, right? How does Steph Curry is definitely not the most talented, right? I mean, he's undersized, he's skinny, he's not quick yet you know, his shooting ability was just pure discipline and work mm -hmm. ethic and, and everything else. Right. And wh why are all these other athletic guys that can't shoot? Well, they just lack the discipline to mm -hmm. figure out how to shoot and, you know, handle pressure and, and the things we're talking about. And I've noticed that in business because in business, there's not any special requirements to be <laughs> great. Like in real estate or business, it's like, bro, all these guys are just normal people. Like they're not any, like there, there's no guy that's like so much bigger, faster and stronger than everyone that he's just the guy. There's no guy that's like literally a genius. And mm -hmm. you know, th th there could be, a, there could be your Elon Musk, who's like literally a genius, but then he's got his own problems that yeah. he's got to deal with. And so you start to say, man, how, why are these guys having success and others aren't? Why are all these math whizzes who, you know, are so great? Why are they normal freaking people who, mm -hmm are unhappy and whatever else. And you're like, to me anyways, as a guy who has succeeded in lots of different industries, I've realized I'm like, I'm definitely not like so gifted at social media or real estate or baseball. Like I just know the process to be successful. Mm -hmm. The process requires discipline. It requires coaching. Mm -hmm. It requires work ethic. You mix all those things together. You have the ability to adapt and pivot and execute on things that you're learning that's what makes you successful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i know i love that and you know even at the top level uh, last year I, I got to speak to uh, the football team at university of north carolina which is where i went to school so it was just sort of a yeah a, 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 you know tar a heel. List thing for me and i'm a tar heel you know yeah so i'm there with mac brown and the team and i was talking to one of the coaches and and he said you know at this level what happens is that every one of these kids they were the most talented person in their whole high school mm -hmm. and maybe even their whole conference. Yep. And so all of their lives, they've been more talented than everyone. Now they get here and everyone is as talented as them. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the dividing line becomes mental fortitude, mental yes. strength. Yep. And, and that's the thing I found in life itself is that once you're out of high school or out of college, all the external structures are gone. Yes, you're out on your own. Yeah. You're, you're grown up now. And so I had the great advantage of doing terrible in the structures. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, so once I was on my own, it didn't feel different because I, I had always already been on my own. But the people I saw that were incredibly successful in high school and college, they didn't do as well. Right. And it, usually it's because, not because of talent or intelligence or gifting, it's all about mental strength. Yeah. And it's about these, these subtle little mental constructs, you know, and like in, in mind shift, like one of my favorite chapters is a chapter that it says, um, it's called, uh, no one knows what they're doing. And whenever I started a new career in my life, I thought I'm the only one who doesn't know what they're doing, <laughs> you know, it, cause that's what it feels like, mm -hmm. you know? And I realized that most of the time within a year, I could essentially be an expert in that area. 1000%. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't take a lot it to, doesn't. to get to the top of the field. The difference is that you will, you will fly back at, by everyone who thinks they already know everything. Mm. The moment you think you know everything, you're dead. You should move on to a different career. <laughs> Do you feel, this is how I feel is like, and I don't want it to be like arrogance or mm -hmm. anything, but like, I just feel like in any industry I really wanted to put my mind to, I could go dominate. Absolutely. Because it's the mental structures. Yeah. And, and 
I, I, and I, I sat down with a guy who lost a couple of billion dollars and he was uh, pretty devastated, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I said, Hey, when you started from scratch, what did you have? And he goes, I had nothing. Yeah. So you could, you created like a multi-billion dollar world from nothing. He goes, yes. I said, so why, are, what are you afraid of now? Cause you don't have nothing. You have the, all the experience of having made a few billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So you're not starting where you started. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he just stopped and he remembered who he was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, cause in a moment he just forgot who he was. Right. And I'm going, you, you have stuff in your head that, that you had billions, but you're worth billions. Yeah. <laughs> There's, you know, right. You already have inside of you, the mental constructs to succeed. Yeah. And you can take it to any area of life and succeed. And that's why you end up looking like a genius, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's a good point. I brought this up to somebody else where they're like, man, dude, like you take a lot of risk and stuff. I'm mm -hmm. like, heck yeah, dude. I love it. And he's like, are you not afraid of like losing it all? I'm like, no, because you cannot take away the important part of what I have, which is the skills, yeah. you know, the mindset, the relationships. If you want to say social media, the audience, the like you can't take that away. You could take the money away. You could take the business away. You could take the real estate away. I'll build it back up mm -hmm. really fast, way faster than what it took to get to the, because like now that you just, you know how to do it yeah. and you'll do it way quicker. And I was like, but what I'll say is I understand why other people are more risk averse because if you have, for instance, somebody who's like a W2 worker, right? Mm -hmm. And they're they're working really hard and they're they're, you know, yeah. building up their stock portfolio, they're buying some properties here or there, and like, you know, they they build up a little nest egg and it took them 30 years. It's like they did it, but they didn't really learn any skills or, you know, they just kind of did it. And it's like, yeah, if they lose it, they're it would take them 30 years again to do it. And so it's kind of rough. And a part of the challenge is that we're educated from first grade through college to be great employees. Yeah. And by the way, it's why Aaron and I, uh, my son created the arena. Mm -hmm. so I, I thought, you know, interesting thing about entrepreneurs is they normally do not do well in formal education, but they're really high learners, but they learn like Navy SEALs, <laughs> you know, in a sense, like they learn in crisis, they learn in the middle of the fight and, uh, and I thought we need to create a new world with adaptive learning where, you know, usually adults learn when they're in crisis, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't go to marriage counseling when your marriage is good. You go the moment <laughs> it starts going bad, you, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, and just like everyone who listens to you, the ones who aren't going through the challenge of a business crisis, they're not going to remember what you said. Right. But everyone who's listening to you, who's going through something that matches what you're talking about. And they're going to remember everything you said because adults do not learn in a sense, um, in advance notice, you know, adults learn in the moment they need to learn it. And that's when they become voracious. And I think that's why podcasts are doing so well. That's why shows like your show are doing so well. This, this is the new world of education. Yeah. People want to learn from people who are actually doing it and they want to learn it in real time mm -hmm. when they're doing it. Yeah. We were talking about sports and you were talking about UNC's football team. And I'm sure you've seen like what Deion Sanders is doing. I was just watching one of his yeah. talks today. Dude, I love crazy. what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. What do you like? What do you think about all that? Like, how is he turning that thing around so quickly? Well, I mean, I think there's several things he did. One is um, he believes in the talent of the people he brought with him. Yeah. And they believe in his leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, so he, you know, he didn't change the culture at Colorado. He brought in a new culture. <laughs> he got rid of everything. <laughs> he got rid of everyone and brought in what, 82 players. And he, def he, he's defied all the conventional thinking. Yeah. And, and one of the things I love, I mean, Frank, as a dad, I love how he believes in his sons. Yeah. And I think that translates in the way he believes in his players. Mm -hmm. I also think he was a guy who, um, understands exactly what he's looking for. Even in controversial, he talked about his quarterbacks. He goes, I need my quarterbacks to have a two parent family. Yep. I mean, no one can get away with saying that. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. Only Deion Sanders could do that. Right. And he starts talking about what he's looking for in his players. He understands the psychological dynamics that play out on the field beyond talent. Do you think that comes from his Christian background? It does. Yeah. 
And it, it, but it comes back from his non-Christian background and his Christian background. Before he was saved, yep. Yeah, it, it comes from him knowing what he was going through when he didn't believe in God and did yeah. not have a faith in Jesus and how all that success was crushing him and how he was actually fragmenting under the weight of success. Mm -hmm. And so he translated that over and realizing if I can put, because what faith does, I mean, think about this. The moment you actually embrace the idea that God created you as a unique individual with purpose and intention, your level of confidence increases dramatically. Right. And the moment you believe that life isn't about this win and loss, it's about the person you become, now you're, you're not crushed by a loss. You can handle failure and success. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think what Dion is doing, it's, like a, it's a brilliant social experiment beyond the fact that uh, he just does things differently. He's flamboyant. He's loud. Yeah. He's uh, you know he he he's bold. You know, he he doesn't fit into the system, and so I am actually so excited because he's going to open up a whole new world for a different kind of coaching, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. Yeah, you know, I think urban kids need urban representation and leadership so they can realize there's no ceiling for them. Yeah, you know, just like I'm a Latin American. I'm from El Salvador. And I, 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 I've spoken at some conferences and I didn't realize I'm the only Latin American that has ever been invited on those platforms. And I just spoke at one recently. I think their registration is like 350,000 people. Oh, whoa. And I had people come up crying, going, I'm from Argentina or I'm from Puerto Rico or I'm from Guatemala. And I've never seen a Latin on that stage. And for them, I broke a ceiling. I let them know that you can get to the other side of that ceiling. And I think that's a part of what Deion Sanders is going, hey, you don't have to conform to other people's expectations of you. Right. And, and there is no ceiling for you. I think that's really, really important. And, and, and honestly, early on in my life, you know, I learned English. My, I didn't want to have an accent. So I, 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 I listened to um, a guy named Peter Jennings, who was a newscaster, and learned how to refine my accent. <laughs> and, but I'm still like purely Latin in my heart and my soul. I'm going to El Salvador in October to speak there at a conference with the president. And, but I began realizing as I got older, it doesn't matter to me what I feel like. I can help a lot of Latinos know that there's no limit for them. Right. That there's no ceiling for them. Mm -hmm. And because I would speak at conferences and they would always there was always this narrative of it's other people holding us down. And I would say, hey, look, let's say the whole world's against you. Let's say that no one wants to give you a chance. Mm -hmm. Let's say everything is leveraged for your failure. They still can't stop you. Mm -hmm. And you decide when all the unfairness in the world uh, is going to be your limitation. Because people go, yeah, the world isn't fair. That's right. That's the real world. Yeah. The world is not fair. Yep. You're never going to fix the fairness of the world. You just have to rise above it. Mm -hmm. So I just love the fact. I mean, honestly, I, I carry like a badge. You know, I never knew my real father. Mm. You know, my, my grandparents raised me for the first few years of my life. My mom was, you know, a single mom that had to raise me and my brother. Then my two sisters was remarried. And my, my stepdad was involved in creative underground economies. <laughs> you know, I lived with an alias all my life. Erwin McManus wasn't my name. Got it. I, I never knew who I was. And is we moved from- Is that your real name now? It is now. I had to make it legal because my wife and son were McManus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know I, I have a million reasons why I could excuse a life not lived to its full potential. Right. And, and I look at all that and go, no, nah, man, that's just like, that's the obstacle course. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's really important to help people know um, it doesn't matter where you start. You know, you, you cannot let other people define you. Yeah. And I love the fact that his son, other people didn't believe in him. Yeah. You, know, De, you know, Deion's son is a quarterback at Colorado because others did not see the talent that was in him. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that his dad saw the talent and decided to shift his whole life yeah. to make sure his son had the opportunity to achieve his own personal greatness. Yeah. I believe in that. And, uh, and, and, and I think, Ryan, every time you do your show, there are just so many people who look at you and go, okay, I may not be Ryan, but if Ryan can do it, mm -hmm. I can do this.
Yeah. You, you know, and, and I want to be that guy too. Like, you know, until I take my last breath, I want to redefine what's possible. You know, I'm 65 now. I'm going, I want to redefine what 60s are. Yeah. You know? I think you are. And, uh, and, you know, I told my wife, the longer I live, the more insane I'm going to be. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, what do I really have to worry about? In my 90s? Yeah. Like, if I lived in my 90s, I'm going to be the most dangerous person in the world. <laughs> what, what are you going to worry about? You're going to take my life? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's just people saying you're going to live till you're 200 soon. Like, there's, you know. Yeah. You know, I don't know why people want to extend their lives rather than deepen their lives. Mm. You know, I like, I, I'm going to worry less about how long I live. I'm going to, just I'm every day. completely focused on living fully every single day. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah. You know, you brought up a couple of points. I mean, we're both fathers and, um, you know, we're talking about Dion as a father and mm -hmm. then you're talking about him saying, well, I only want quarterbacks who have been raised by two parents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this whole thing of gender roles has become like this hot topic mm -hmm. for some reason. And you know, for me, I, I've, I've talked about it a lot of like, you know, my wife's a stay at home mom, we've got three kids and she absolutely crushes it. And like, man, it brings me so much peace knowing she's doing her thing and her job's way harder than mine. Mm -hmm. I get to sit here and talk to you all day. Like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> her job's way harder. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you have this thing where people are like, well, you know, women can do this and that. And like, you know, uh, th there's just so many like thoughts now. And I've had like different conversations where I'm like, well, dude, there's just nothing that beats like a father raising their child. Like there's scientific evidence, there's, mm -hmm. you know, biblical evidence. And it's like, you know, men were let, uh, men were made to lead their households. Mm -hmm. Like there's just no other way around it. And, you know, I've, I've talked to even Christian, um, couples where it's like the woman's leading. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I mean, that's not even biblical. Like mm -hmm you just weren't designed that way. And then, you know, you see this huge like movement of like these red pill guys, like talking about all these ultra masculine things. Yeah. I'm curious what your perspective on all of it is. Well, yeah, I grew up with a mom who's an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, and, and if it hadn't been for her, uh, we wouldn't have eaten. Yeah. <laughs> and we wouldn't have had a roof over our heads. Yeah. And so I'm really grateful for her. And, and, um, and I, I, so I never grew up with a, a, a mental construct of, there were any limitations for women. Yeah. You know, and um, my daughter, Mariah, she's married as yep. a little girl, Juno. You know? uh, Mariah is such a great leader, so entrepreneurial, travels the world, you know, um, as a musician. Her yep. husband, Jake, is in a band called Laney. Yep. He also travels the world as a musician. Yeah. It's a very unique family, you yeah. know, the way that they're constructed. And, um, you know, I, the way I look at it is go, it, it was a privilege for me to be a husband and father mm -hmm. and it still is i've been married 40 years yeah to the same woman and i say that because i have to qualify it kim has never stayed the same <laughs> you know? and my wife just keeps changing yeah and um and you know we have this great marriage this great relationship but the greatest testimony to my life is that my son aaron and my daughter mariah are still my friends they want to be close they live within minutes of us by choice mm -hmm. and they want to be in our lives every day yeah. And they're, they really are my best friends. And so there's nothing to me more important than my family. You know, but with Kim, you know, Kim and I both have master's degrees mm -hmm. and she's an educator. And um, she made the choice to stay home when her kids were born. It wasn't always easy for her because she, uh, I mean, she runs a couple of humanitarian organizations. She built a million dollar school in Malawi. Mm. She's built places to help young women escape the sex trade in Bangladesh. Yeah. She's worked developing women leaders in India. I mean, she's just all over the world all the time. And, and so our lives are very non-conventional in that way. Yeah. Um, but I just can't imagine. Well, I can, I, I, I know what it's like to always wonder who your dad is. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I'm 65 and I still feel that. Like that sense of, I wish I'd known my father. Yeah. It, it's inescapable. Still a scar. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so I'm not a person that would say, would say um, there isn't, that women don't have unlimited capacity and potential. Like I, I, I can see a woman in any role in any job, um, but I don't think that's um, in any way to diminish the fact that I think being a parent, being a mom and dad is the greatest gift in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I took it as my role to be the leader of our home. Yeah. You know, and I joke with my wife saying she 
can't pronounce the word submission. <laughs> and, uh, I, but I've never tried to make Kim submit. Yeah. I, I think a lot of men, I always tell guys, look, the word submission is, is submission under your mission. Uh. If you don't have a mission, how can she get under it? Right. And then and if your bar is so low that your wife can't get under it, don't get mad at her because she's over it. And by the way, <laughs> when I'm talking to a lot of my Christian guy, mm -hmm. you know, that's a lot of the problem. Yeah. But she's not the problem. The problem is he's kind of weak. Yeah. The, the, the way you fix it is you don't make your wife less. You yeah. have to step up and be more. Exactly. And so my wife is a risk taker. She's, uh, you know, humanitarian. She's, she sacrifices and um, she's courageous. So I have to step up. Yeah. I have to have a massive vision for life, a massive yeah. vision for the world. I have to run fast. You know, like I don't go, but I never go, Kim, get behind me. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, let, I'm the leader. Get behind me. Like I just have to run hard, live hard, sacrifice more. Yeah, I feel like being the spiritual leader means you serve more, you sacrifice more. You know, you, you set the tone. Yeah, you set the tone of life and marriage, and and I want my wife to want to follow me. Yeah, and, and that I, yeah, I love that. I mean, it's like I don't have to tell my wife, hey, do what I say, yeah. right? Like that's not what we're talking. I've about I've never here. said that, and it has never worked. <laughs> it will not work for sure. So there's, there's two reasons why you wouldn't do it, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it's just fruitless. But but my wife will tell me, um, and she does tell me, like, um, it's an honor to get to follow you. Yeah. And you're, that's you're, the person you're I live. You're saying be a man that yeah. your wife wants to follow, that she wants to serve, and you vice versa. Yeah. Serve. Set the example. Like, if you want her to serve, it starts with you serving. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And And- Marriage is supposed to be this beautiful partnership. Yeah. You know, and Kim is like, you know, my longest term friend. She's the one person who's been with me the whole time. She knew me in extreme poverty. She's known me in my greatest failures. She's been with me in my deepest pain. Yeah. You know, um, I am so grateful I have that shared memory, mm -hmm. you know, together. And, and frankly, like, um, I consider like getting her to live the life that she's created to live as my greatest responsibility. Yeah. You know, I mean, twice the summer, Kim was in Malawi. One of those, she was spent the time with the former president of the country on building houses. She built the premier school for the whole country there. She, I hadn't, I had never gone. I didn't want to go to Malawi. Like that's Kim's thing, right? You know, seven years she's been there, but she goes, I need you to come to Malawi this year. She told me that about eight months ago. Because if you go, the president of Malawi will meet with us mm. and we'll get inroads that we could not have without you. So my wife's basically saying, I want to leverage who you are. <laughs> mm. and, uh, I'm going to need to borrow you. Yeah. So I said, okay. So I took the 36 hour flight <laughs> to Malawi and met with the president, met with people in the cabinet, opened up all these doors. That to me is like, people could say, wait a minute, you're following your wife. You better believe I am because she had a great vision. She has yeah. great passion and I can actually advance what she's doing. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. 100%. Did I want to be there? You know, <laughs> maybe not, you know, I would rather be somewhere else, you know? Yeah. And, and did I have a great time? Unbelievable. Yeah. It was a time of my life. It was yeah. incredible. And I consider that a, a privilege and a gift, Yeah, you know? And at the same time, I couldn't be here if I didn't have this great relationship with my wife. Right. You know, and it, it, it's just like this beautiful thing. I know when she's living the life she's created to live, it gives me the freedom uh, in our relationship to live the life I'm created to live. Yeah. I want her to be happy and fulfilled. Yeah. It, it just makes it all work so beautifully. Yeah. I think the moral of that story and even what I'm saying too is like, you know, be a man that, yeah. you know, deserves to, you know, have your wife follow you and support you. And then people say, well, you know, it should be unconditional. And it's like, well, even so, work on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Years ago, when we were first married, this pastor said, um, I'm going to say it. We were, we were moving to uh, LA and this pastor said, you know, I would do something like that, but you know, my wife and my kids, you know, they just couldn't handle that level of risk. And in front of him, Kim turned to me and said, if you ever use me or our kids as an excuse to not live the life God created you to live, I will leave you. Oh, <laughs> this is early. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she goes, you will never use me as an excuse for she, why you didn't make courageous choices. 
she's a firecracker. Oh yeah, yeah. She's 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 fascinating. Yeah. You know, my wife was eight years old when she was abandoned in a government project, left starving. Wow. And uh, her she has brothers and sisters who were homeless, drug dealers, criminals. And from the age of eight, she lived in a foster home until she was 18 and mm -hmm. uh, sent herself to college, sent herself to get her master's degree, which is where I met her. Wow. And, you know, and I, when I met her, realized that from the age of zero to 18, she never heard the words, I love you one time. Wow. And for me, like the, deciding to marry Kim, I, I felt like it was going to be my privilege to get to love her unconditionally. Yeah. With a love she'd never known all of her life that she was always worthy of. Wow. And, you know, and, and I can say like when you marry someone, because not for what they can give you or do for you, but for the privilege of getting to be someone for them, it, it changes you. Oh, for sure. It, it, you know? And, um, yeah. And I feel like I had the great gift of being, of being married to Kim for 40 years to love someone who deserved all of her life to be loved unconditionally. Yeah. No, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, one thing you talk about a lot is leadership and, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're advising a lot of people on being leaders in their business. We're talking about being a leader in a household right now. And, you know, even for me, I'm, I'm reevaluating myself as a leader and mm -hmm. I'm saying, Hey, you know, at this new stage of business and life and kids and how do I become a better leader, especially as I become like, I guess, more removed, not from my family, but from mm -hmm. like the business. It's like, yeah, when you're a small business, everybody yeah. sees you, it's easy to lead. But now you become a big business. You don't really get to be talking to everybody and leading yeah. and having relationships. You're out doing your things. And, you know, how do you maintain the culture that got you to this point? Because that's one thing I've realized is that as I grow further away, mm -hmm. the the culture of, you know, excellence and winning and, mm -hmm. you know, drive, it, it becomes harder to maintain. Yeah. I, I think the two things that really transcend is make sure that you remain humble, mm -hmm. that you never see yourself as better than other people and make sure that you express gratitude for people. And when you take on those two postures, it, it just transcends throughout the culture. And one of the challenges, you know, and I even thought about this the other day is like, I saw this video of somebody mowing someone's lawn. And I, thought, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, I remember when I used to do that for people. There were like a lot of things I used to do that I don't necessarily have the same capacity or time to do. And so I remind myself, okay, what are the kind things I can do now that just one, keep my heart pure. Right. And, and keep me in that space where, um, the people in the world around me will also know that I'm still grounded in a humility of knowing who I am as a human being, mm -hmm. you, you know, and then just expressing gratitude for people, never acting entitled. Right. You, you know, um, cause it's amazing how gratitude transcends no matter how big your company is. When you, when you express gratitude to people on your teams, they begin to express gratitude to the people around them and it becomes a, a cultural value. Yeah. And, you know, earlier when you're talking about um, like how do you overcome failure, one of the things that really struck me was um, when people are unkind, when they fail, no one runs to help them get up. When people live a life of kindness and they fail, people run to them to make sure they don't stay there. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it, it's interesting, like as you elevate and elevate and elevate, you have to keep reminding yourself that it's the people that matter. Yeah. And, you know, I, I like I made it a goal in my life. I wanted to be the kindest person in the world. I didn't want to be the richest person in the world or the most famous person in the world or the most powerful person in the world. I made a goal decades ago. I said, I want to be the kindest person in the world. Mm. And, and I, I think that that value just always permeates everything that I touch and everything I create. And um, I don't think I've achieved that but because it's a genuine desire in my life, it um, it permeates at every level along the way. I guess my big issue is, man, I mean, I get overly critical. Mm -hmm. And for me, like I, I, you know, as I, I guess a high achiever, a lot of us are always like 
very hard on ourselves. Yeah. And so like, we're very critical. And so it's like, you, you take the wins and you're like, all right, cool. Like that, that was the win. That's fine. But mm -hmm. I, I should have did this. I could have did this better. Right. And so I find myself doing that, um, with other people too. And so, you know, it's obviously like mixing in praise and, and all that, but then like how, you know, you're the kindest guy in the world, but how do you also let people know where they got to improve? And yeah, well, there's a difference between being kind of being nice. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, and, and being kind of being soft. Okay. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that word soft. In a second. I'm not soft. Okay. You know, I, they laugh because Aaron's that's gone. Like, that's my favorite word to, well, not, it's yeah. Not, it's my favorite of like, I think most people are soft. Yeah. I'm not soft. Yeah. And in fact, I had a conversation today with someone about a cultural issue. And, and you told them they're soft? No, I, yeah, I did. Actually, I, I did, did tell them. I did, I, <laughs> okay. I did, I did tell them they were right. soft. Pastor says it's okay to tell them. And, right. and I, I said, um, <laughs> you ignored this problem that will be, end up becoming a crisis because you don't want to deal with the tension. You're soft. Mm. And I, ne I said, I need you to go back and do this again, have a conversation with this person so they can actually have a genuine learning moment. Exactly. And because what you've done is you covered up a problem. By being nice. By being nice. Y you know, and that's not kind because that person isn't going to get better and they're not going to get better to work with. I'm going to say something a little bit controversial, but um, when you're soft, it means that you do not believe in the greatness of the other person. Mm. You do not believe in their resilience, but worse, you do not believe that they have a desire to grow. Because when you avoid speaking to someone's life, you're actually choosing for them a limitation. Because you're not telling them what they need to hear. Yeah. And, and, and so I, had to, I was dealing with that situation today where we have kind of an intern working through a situation. They made some bad choices and they talked them through it, but they didn't press in because they just tried to cover it up. Say, right. hey, you shouldn't have done this. And they go, no, it's, it, that's not good enough. Yeah. And you need to go back and through and go, okay, wait a minute. Your choices caused this kind of damage. So now we're going to work through that and you're going to uh, process through how to repair that. Right. And on top of that, we're going to work through why you made those choices. Yeah. So that you can grow. Because if you believe a person can be a top tier leader, then they have to be able to process their failures and their mistakes and their wrong choices. Mm -hmm. and, and if they can't take criticism, then they're not going to grow. And, right. Yeah. And, and so I, and when I was young, I would say I was uh, ruthless. And my wife would say, don't use the word ruthless. They go, no, I, 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 have a, I had a ruthless commitment to the vision and values that I was committed to in my life. Mm -hmm. And I held myself to the highest standard in the world. Yeah. And, um, and I was committed to creating something really extraordinary, really inventive. No matter what I do, I, I, I strive to be the very best I can be, you know, and when I, when I work, when I design clothes, I mean, my, my clothes is expensive. I've yeah. made a $10,000 jacket, Whoa. You, you know, and, uh, and, you know, make, you know, anoraks and hoodies and different things that are worth thousands of dollars. People always say, wait a minute, why is your stuff so expensive? And I go, because it's the best. <laughs> I'm going to be the best. I'm going to yeah. create the best. I, I go and find the best fabrics in the world. I, you know, I, you know, I, I have stuff I've never released it cost me tens of thousands of dollars because it did not match my expectation of quality. Mm. And so if people realized how much I invest and how much I actually sacrifice to try to get to a level of excellence, then they would understand. And I want that for the people on my teams. I want them to have a commitment to being the highest expression of themselves. Mm. They don't need to be me and they don't, they don't need to be anyone else, but I, but I want them to do some self evaluation and go, what, what do I really want of my life? Yeah. You know, what, what's the standard that I have for my life? And, um, and then if that standard matches us organizationally, then you're the right match. But if it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're not a good person or that I'm a not a good person. It just means we're not a good match. 
Yes. You know, for working together. I move fast, Ryan. Like, and I take really hard risks. And it can be, uh, and, you know, I have a team that's been with me for 20 years. I mean, some of them have been with me for a long, long time. They've been with me when I was doing church. They were with me in the business world. They're with me in fashion and film. They come back with me to Mosaic. They've just been with me the whole time. And they will tell you, working for me is like working in a tornado. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And But they also tell you, in 20 years, I've never yelled at them one time. Right. And, and even last night when I was working through some things and I was very frustrated, I sent a little text saying, I want to be clear, I am not mad. Because texts come across really harsh. Yeah. So I sent a text, I'm not mad, but I'm not satisfied. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this does not meet my expectations. Yeah. And I want walk through and said, here, 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 you know, and, and then, you know, my executive, uh, you know, chief of staff, she, she sent me a note back. You're never mad, but we want this feedback. We yeah. need this to get better. Yeah. And that's why she's still with me 20 years later <laughs> <laughs> because she's always looking to improve, but right. it wasn't her. It was someone that she had to meet with. Yeah. And I said, you let them off the hook. Yeah. Like, I don't let me off the hook and I don't want you to let me off the hook. And so let's, let's assume everyone wants to grow yeah. until they tell us differently. So what you're describing is basically like how I feel. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's two things that I am trying to reconvey back into the culture. And so tell mm -hmm. me, maybe you'll help me formulate what I'm trying to say. So on one side, you mentioned the soft side and mm -hmm. I've said that's like, <laughs> I don't want to say it's my favorite word, but it's like <laughs> the, the way I describe soft is that you're either complacent, you're either entitled or you just don't realize like how good you have it and <laughs> you're complaining. And that's, you know, to me soft, right? And that's like, exactly what's happening. Somebody was complaining. Yeah. It usually is from complaining, yeah, but they were not complaining up. Or even complaining parallel, they're complaining down, right? Which actually hurts the culture. Yes, yes. And yeah. so for me, I'm like, well, you're soft. Like you, you don't even know what hard is. Like you're complaining about a situation that's not even worth complaining about, right? Mm -hmm. And then two, it's like that. That goes back to yeah, like you're capable of more. And it's like I would never call somebody soft who's like doing their absolute best, and it's not you know, that great, right? Like their mm -hmm. talent level is just not quite there, but they're giving right. it their all. But if I see somebody who's got great talent, yet they're complaining and, mm -hmm. you know, bad attitude, whatever, right? I'm like, you're soft. That's just how I see it. Mm -hmm. um, right or wrong, I don't know if that's the right wording, but that's my definition. And I don't want those people. Um, those people wouldn't be happy in your organization anyway. They wouldn't what? They wouldn't be happy. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm going to push and, them. And so you're doing them a great gift. <laughs> by, by, by like letting it be known. and Yeah, because yeah. there are places that people can work and be soft. Yeah. And still be super valued. That's true. You, you know, and so what I'm going to say is like, if you're listening and you're soft, <laughs> <laughs> you're loved and you have value. <laughs> There's places you can work. <laughs> but you don't want to work in a high driving organization. No, you don't. And, no. and that's the difference is that, and I just think it's someone, it's just being self-aware. Yeah. Like Mosaic, even, you know, as a church, Mosaic is incredibly futuristic. I mean, it's high risk, high invention. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it moves fast. It's not like other places. Yeah. And I, and I just let people know, Hey, this is, this is a different place. This is a hard place to work. This yeah. is um, a place where you have to have massive ambition. You have to have a lot of energy. I, I use a deep psychological assessment and um, that allows me to factor in a person's physical energy. Okay. It's on a scale of one to 99. Okay. And my physical energy is somewhere around 96. I see that. <laughs> and, and, and I have people, some people on my team whose energy, physical energy was like a two. Mm. And, and I had to decide when I was looking at this assessment, do you fire those people? So once again, I'm glad you actually brought this up because mm -hmm. this is um, one of my things of like leaders, especially in sales, where mm -hmm. it's a very high energy job, right? And so if your leader is not high energy, that permeates to everyone else. Absolutely. But let me tell you, my number, my, my guy with a two score is one of my best guys now. Okay. I sat down with him. I said, 
your physical energy capacity is simply not what mine is. Yes. So you can't model your life on my life. You're not going to be a 96. Yeah. And so using me as a model for the patterns you want to establish is not good. Let's figure out how to take your two and optimize it so that every time you're in the room, that two feels like a 99. Right. Because even if you're a two, if you are intentional, you can come in with 99 energy. For spurts. Yeah, for spurts. Yeah. And so you just need to realize you got like 90 minutes and then you got to step back. <laughs> you're going to burn out. <laughs> you're going to burn out. Yeah, you will yeah. get a latte. <laughs> yeah. You know, that croissant or something. No, you can't eat gluten when you're a two. No, that's you're true. Be that's done. true. And then you, and <laughs> he actually feels like a 99 every single time he's in the room. Yeah. And I feel like that yeah. too. Like I'm, you know, I've, I've, my energy is definitely not a 96, mm -hmm. but when I go on stage or what, I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, time to bust it to a 99 and let's crank, yeah. you know, like I just know how to turn it on and off. Yeah. And that comes from sports. It's like, oh, it's game time. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. And I learned this from uh, watching Jim Brown. It, wait, you're, you're too young. I know this. he is. But okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of the greatest running backs who ever lived. Yep. Whenever Jim Brown got tackled and he would walk back to the huddle, he looked like he was either injured or ready to pass out. <laughs> <laughs> he would just move so slow and he, he seemed like he had no energy left. And then the moment that ball was snapped, he would explode. Right. And so I realized, oh, and I, I, I fortunately got this early in life. It's not about time management. It's about energy management. Yes. 1000%. And Jim Brown had this, I don't know if it was a conscious or unconscious ability to manage his energy so that he only exploded when necessary. Yes. And there were a series of years where I traveled across the country speaking in coliseums of 20, 30, 40,000 people every single week. So I was traveling all over the country every Friday night in different city, speaking these massive, you know, stadiums. And it was, um, and I would fly back to LA. The, I was a dad and my kids were in school, you know, I'm married. I'm also uh, leading Mosaic at the same time and running a business. Yeah. And, um, and I had to learn how to manage my energy. And so I would look like I was dormant. <laughs> half asleep before I walked onto that stage. Yep. And then most of these places that were super extroverted. So they'd want me to hang out with them before I spoke. And they wanted me to be in this meeting and, and they were a Christian. So they wanted me to be in a prayer meeting with them. And they yeah. wanted, and I said, you, you have two options. I can either be in all the stuff with you guys that made you feel really good before I speak and be average on stage. Yeah. Or I can be released from all of this and maybe be extraordinary on stage. Yeah. And, and so I would just walk around the coliseums and walk around the stadiums by myself, highly introverted. And, and then when I walked on stage, I would explode with energy. Yeah. You need to learn how to manage energy, not time. And one of the things I, I work a lot with people is helping them understand their energy flow, their physical energy, their emotional energy, um, their social energy, and, uh, uh, and walk through different, um, energy spaces and go, this is what's actually extracting the most energy from you. Yes. You know, like you could, you could be um, an extroverted person who achieves, who experiences massive um, social energy from people, uh, or you could be, but, or, but, or you could be a person who has massive social energy, but low physical energy. Right. And, or you could be a person who has very low social energy, but high physical energy. Me. It, it, you know, and, and then the other people have high emotional energy and decision-making. And so what happens is that if you use a lot of emotional energy and decision-making, th making hard decisions costs you a lot yeah. and you feel exhausted when it's over. Yeah. And if you use low emotional energy and decision-making, you actually can make a lot of decisions and it doesn't bother you at all. Yeah. And, and so there are four different arenas I usually look at. And, and I think this is where it's really important to know how to help people optimize who they are so they can be at their best at any moment. And with my team, I just, I go, look, I don't care how drained you are when you're not needed. Yeah. You know, I don't care how introverted you are. I don't care how non-relational you are. Yeah. You know, the moment it's go time. You need to, I don't care if, you, if you're an introvert, you are extroverted. Yes. You know, I, I, I don't care if you have low, Physical energy, you have high physical energy at this moment. It's time to step up. Yeah, it's time to step up. And that's where it's about being fully present. Yeah. And when you when you have people 
who are willing to be fully present, um, then you have a really great team. Yeah. So I guess to sum up, do you think that, I don't know, saying that somebody is soft is, I don't know, just like negative or <laughs> should I just stop doing it and keep it to myself and be like, I mean, they're just soft. I don't know what else to do. I'm like, and I'm just <laughs> like, you know, I'm going to always call people out for how yeah. they're going to improve. That's the culture. I tend to think people are soft if they're unteachable. Yeah. And that would probably be where I would use it. Like you, you can't take critique. Yeah. And, um, and, but, or you get offended easily. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. No, no. If you can't take critique, if you're not teachable, yeah. you get offended really easily. Yeah. And one, it's more important for people to recognize when they're soft. You're soft when you criticize. Yes. And when you, when you're talking about other people, and I said this today in my meeting with my chief of staff, criticizing others is a psychological uh, default mode to give yourself permission to not take personal responsibility. Correct. Yeah. And so when you start critiquing other people, you don't have to take personal responsibility for your underachievement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You never hear criticism from people who are overachieving. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have time to think about what other people are doing wrong. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm worried about my people and getting yeah. the most out of them, right? Yeah. And making them the best that they can be. So, you know, I would say, um, you can say people are soft if that's a part of the culture. <laughs> you know, they know that you use that language. Yeah. Um, I would never do it in a room in front of other people. Okay. That's my problem too. Yeah. I used to do that when I was your age. Okay. And it was really detrimental to the culture. Okay. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you have to realize when you do that, it's for you and not for them. Okay. Cause you're just mad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you're trying to tell the culture, I do not allow softness. Yeah. You know, and if you're going to call someone out for being soft, it should always be first one-on-one. -on -one. Got it. Okay. Okay. Because then you give a person a chance to change. Well, I guess to not publicly calling people out one-on-one, -on -one, but like, I, I don't know. And I guess if you're, you're speaking- Affirm publicly, group, critique privately. Right. Okay. It's, it's, it's a way to create a healthier culture. Yeah. Now, the second thing that I've been thinking a lot about is just like this concept of, at first I thought it was competing, but the more I've like thought about it and think about it, really it's just this concept of like winning. And mm -hmm. for me, like, you know, take away all the other motivations of, mm -hmm. man, you know, I, I want to make more money. I want to provide for my family. I want to give like, you know, those all things that are byproducts mm -hmm. of an action. And it's just like, dude, if I want to do something, like you said, I just want to be the best. Like, I just want to win. Like freaking, if I'm going to make clothes, I want to make the best clothes. If mm -hmm. I'm going to play golf, I want to win. If I'm going to make a podcast, it's better be the best produced podcast ever. You know, like my whole goal is just winning. And every successful <laughs> person that I've ever dealt with thinks similarly. You know, you brought up like Kobe and Rafa and these guys, they're not doing it for the money. You know, they just want to win. They just want to be the best version of themselves. And these entrepreneurs, they're all the same way. They just, at the end of the day, they just want to win right. whatever game they're playing. I'm going to nuance what you said because you put two different concepts in the same sentence. Okay. You said they all want to win, but they want to be the best version of themselves. Yeah. Those are two different things. Okay. That's why I'm trying to wordsmith. What, it, what am I trying to say? Well, I want to hear you saying is you want to win. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All and, right. uh, but what I would like to propose is that you shift it to, I want to be the best version of myself. Okay. And, um, and it, I think I can say this. Okay. Like, you know, when I'm with some of my friends, like Ed Milet and um, John Gordon and Jamie Lima, and they're all like some of the best, like entrepreneurs in the world. Yep. And some of the best communicators in the world. But it is funny how many times I've walked in a room with these guys or like that. And they all go, who's the best speaker? Yeah, they all want to be that. They're oh all competing. Oh my gosh. You know? And um, and I've never, I never get in that kind of, I always say, you're the best. You know, <laughs> always, um, you know you're the best. You know? And you're like, but actually I'm the best. And, uh, <laughs> and one of the last times we're all together, I said, is it possible that the measure is wrong? Okay. Uh, because when you're, asking the question, who's the best communicator? 
you think it's all about the communicator and not the audience. Mm. Because it's like asking, what's the best food in the world, Italian or Chinese or French? Well, isn't it about the palate of the person eating the meal? And when you say you're the best communicator in the world, you're assuming that you're the, the right person, the best person to speak to every person every single time. Right. You're, you're and, the best for certain people. Yeah. And I would, I, my goal is not to be the best in that sense because I'm not competing against them. Right. I, my, my goal is to be a unique, irreplaceable version of myself. Okay. Like um, when I speak at an event, I don't want to be a person compared to the person going, I think he was better than him. Right. I want people to go, that guy was completely different than everyone else. Mm -hmm. So I'm measuring winning differently. Yes. <laughs> you know? But you're, you're still trying to win your game. You just are playing a different game. No, that's exactly right. I am playing a different game. And I listened to this interview with Kobe and he was talking about how um, he, it wasn't about loving winning or hating losing. It was about him competing with himself. Yes. To become the best version of himself. Mm -hmm. And that was where I had the most resonance. Yeah. You, and, you know, and I, I would say, I always say like being the best, being the best, like I want to be the best. And with winning, you know, that's like one way of showing mm -hmm. you're the best, but you know, in, in many parts, like th this culture of winning or being the best or competing, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like you're competing against uh, somebody else, right? But like, you really are. You're just pretending you're not. Okay. And whenever you think about winning, there's definitely a loser. Correct. I had this young guy come up to me at Mosaic and say, hey, is it um, wrong to be competitive? Okay. And, um, and I said, Where, where'd you hear that? You know, but it's, a lot of Christians think, think it's wrong to be competitive. And I said, not only is it not wrong to be competitive, it's actually healthy okay. to be competitive. And he goes, yeah, but I mean like competitive where I can look around the room, go, I won and they lost. Okay. And I said, oh, okay. I thought you wanted to be great. Okay. Like, I thought you wanted to be the best. He goes, why well, do? And I said, no, as long as you're comparing yourself against someone else, you're not the best. Right. See, because when you compare yourself against others, once you're better than everyone, you have no motivation for advancement or improvement. Mm -hmm. When you're aspiring to greatness, your measurement cannot be another person. Correct. It literally has to be the measure of your own self-improvement. And so I'm more ambitious than maybe you would think in that sense. I'm more competitive because I don't see anyone as my competition. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to bring something to the event that you can't compare with. Yeah. And I'm going to bring a level of thinking and approach toward reality, a perspective that no one's ever seen before. Like earlier when you said, oh, I never heard that. Yeah. See that for me, that's my moment. Yeah. It, it, you know, not, am I the best guest you've ever had? Or yeah, yeah. am I the best interview? We get in the most views, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, ah, I shared something that Ryan had never thought about. Yep. I already had my win. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and cause I want to add value that no one else can add. Yeah. And that for me is my measure, you know? And um, I mean, have I thought about, do I want to be the greatest communicator in the world? Absolutely. And, but you know where it came from? When I was working with urban poor and I would go to the grocery store and in the grocery stores, there was expired meat, vegetables that already were past their expiration date milk that was at the end of the expiration date. Mm -hmm. and I would realize in impoverished areas, they got the worst food, the worst produce, the worst meats. And I would look at the billboards and every billboard was about something destructive, whether it was alcohol or cigarettes. There were, there were no productive billboards in the area. And I realized that the poor never have access to the best of anything. Mm -hmm. And so when I was there as a speaker, I told myself, I want to be the best in the world so that I can bring them the best so that maybe in one arena in their life, they had something given to them that was better than what the most affluent 
and entitled people in the world ever have. And so my drive to be a great communicator was actually because I wanted to be a gift to the people I was serving. Mm. Not because I needed anyone to think that I was the best in the world or because I wanted that fame or yeah. that acknowledgement. I think, Ryan, the moment we start getting more self-conscious um, about our measurement against others, I think we're already declining. Right. Y you know? Yeah. And I think, I guess for me, when I was playing baseball, it was definitely like, you're looking at other people. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. And that's that was very toxic. Yeah. And the moment I got out of baseball, you know, I just started pursuing business and everything mm -hmm. else. It was like, all right, you know, I'm just doing me and like, I'm just going to be the best version of me. And like, you know, you do that for a long time. And obviously, you know who your competitors are. Yeah. And for me, I take inspiration. I'm like, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're clearly ahead in one aspect of whatever yeah. it is we're comparing. But, you know, I'm over here and that this is more important to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I use like inspiration from those guys. Absolutely. I use benchmarks. Yes. Like, I'll listen, you know, if it's the John Gordon or Ed Milet or someone, and I'll go, what did they do in that moment that's so connected to me? Yeah. How do I utilize that yeah. and do that? Yeah, no, and it, I'm always inspired. And I, I, I mean, when I read someone's book and I go, oh, wow, this was incredible writing. Yeah. Like it affects my writing. Yeah. It, you know, it, without question, I'm yeah. always benchmarking and uh, looking at other people and trying to elevate my game. Well, and like, even from the Christian perspective, I mean, that is, I mean, what we're talking about is sanctification. And it's just this ongoing process of just improvement and becoming yeah. more like Jesus. And by the way, where I think Jesus was misunderstood is that um, when Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, be the servant of all, mm -hmm. that has been translated to believe or interpreted to believe, oh, you, you shouldn't want to be great. You should be a servant, want to be a servant. You should be lesser. Than, yeah. yeah. But actually what Jesus is saying is, what I'm about to tell you doesn't even apply to you if you don't want to be great. Mm. It says, if you want to be great. So there's the if. If you want to be great. So if you don't want to be great, don't even pay attention to the rest of it. But if you want to be great, become the servant of all. See, Jesus is not saying to them, you should not want to be great. What he's saying to them is, the process to greatness is different than you think. Mm. The process to greatness is servanthood. And if you will live your life to serve others, then you will be on the path to greatness. And that just stuck with me with what you said about speaking in front of all those people. You're like, I want to serve these people and give them an experience they've never had before. Mm -hmm. And that requires you to become great yeah. at your craft to do it. Yeah. So Jesus does want you to be great. Yeah. And um, it's just like humility. If a person is weak, they're not humble, they're weak. You can only be humble if you're strong. Yeah. And humility is an irrelevant conversation. If you're weak. If you're weak. Yeah. It's the, you know, we were talking about this today in Bible study of like, what is meekness? And you know, it's like, for me, the biblical definition is power under control. Yeah. Like you, you cannot be meek if you have no power. You're just weak at that point. Yeah, the word meek really comes from um, horses. And that it's controlled strength. Yeah. And, and, you know, and so you're not meek if you're weak. Yeah. You, you don't have strength. You can't control something you don't have. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it, it, to me, it was always like, I need to be a strong and forceful and powerful human being. Yes. As I can be. Mm -hmm. And then carry that with humility. You get me and fired up. And kindness. You get me fired up to like, just go wreck some stuff, dude. Yeah. You're getting my energy level from like a 50 to a 62. <laughs> All right, well, let's get it up. Let's get it up. <laughs> no, because, you know, I, I've i always, I, I mean, I had just so driven, like I, I, I'm at Mosaic and I, uh, average age is like 26 in the church. Wow, that's amazing. And I tell myself, look, the truth is that most of you have less courage than I have. You, you just live with, you have no guts. Do you tell them they're soft? I tell them they're soft. I do <laughs> on the stage. I say, look, I'm 65 and I'm taking more risks than you. Yeah. I'm more adventurous than you. Oh my gosh. I'm more don't courageous. Get me started you on need to outlive me. Don't get me started on young people who don't take risk. 
I just had a conversation <laughs> in New York. I, with it someone. drives me nuts. He was 22 and I'm going, <laughs> your 20s should be filled with endless failures and risks. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's funny, this summer, um, you know, Aaron, uh, my son, who's here with us and he's 35. Yep. And uh, he went through something this summer and uh, everything we create, we create together. I mean, it's just really exciting, really fun. But um, he had like a, a huge challenge he had to deal with and he had an opportunity to go to London. Mm -hmm. And he goes, hey, dad, I think I'm going to take off to London for a month. And, and I said, you need to go. Yeah. And we watched a show called 1923. And one of the guys in 1923 went to Africa to hunt lions. And he goes, I need to go hunt lions. Yeah. And, and, I, and I just said, look, yeah, um, you need to take adventures. You need to take risks. You need to always be pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. So he goes to London for a month. Yeah. And he switches houses with someone. Oh, they, wow. They, they take his house for a month. He takes their place. I've seen that in movies. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. And I just said, look, every day, here, here, every day meet someone and every day have dinner with someone that was a stranger. Mm. And so I started giving him these challenges. Yeah. And like, there's different ways of taking, of, of expressing courage. I think the greatest and most dramatic, courageous acts are relational. When you, you take the courage of meeting new people and building new friendships and, and developing new levels of trust and becoming vulnerable with people. And, yeah. and it was pretty awesome to going, Hey, I just met this couple and now I'm going to their house for Sunday brunch and, yeah. you know, and, and a whole world opens up that is unexpected. And on the, and on the fun side, the reason I flew in here from New York is um, I had this mastermind group and one of the guys in the mastermind group sends out a general uh, WhatsApp note. Um, at the U.S. Open, have two tickets. Anyone to come? Anyone want to come? I was wondering how you got those freaking yeah. amazing. And, seats. and I said, when he goes today, and I said, oh, I can't make it today. And and he goes, well, I've got one ticket for the finals on Sunday. And I said, I'm in. Like yeah. before everyone else, everyone else in the mastermind is way more wealthy than me. They run <laughs> their own company, so they have more freedom. And um, and I said, I'm in. I, I'll take it. You know, that night I told my wife, Hey, honey, um. I'm flying to New York <laughs> to go to the U.S. Open. So I catch a red eye. I go to New York. I, I, I'm on the second row of the U.S. Open. Yeah. Like there's only one row in front of me. And I'm with people like this guy's introducing me people going, hey, this guy lent me $100 million. And, <laughs> you know, he financed the, you know, the Dodgers. And this guy, he, he has all these seats here. And, you know, he, he um, and, and he, were, he owns this company. And they're all like on a whole different scale. Yeah. And the guy that I'm sitting next to uh, just won a $4.2 billion settlement. Jeez. And yeah. So like I'm, I'm surrounded by people of just extraordinary capacity. And uh, he goes, I can't believe you showed up. I can't believe you showed up. And, and because of that, I ended up going to Monday Night Football. And then I meet these strangers. And one of them goes, hey, do you want to go to the Super Bowl? And I go, yeah, I'll go to the Super Bowl. And the other guy goes, hey, um, I'll, I'll get a suite for the next US Open. You want to come to that? And I'm meeting all these people who are now opening up new opportunities. Yeah. The Super Bowl is here in Vegas, I think. Is it here? Oh, that's right. That's what they told me. Yeah. So like, you know, mm -hmm. if you have an extra seat. Like I'll, I'll hop on it too. All right. I'll let you know. So you and, let me know. I'll be there. And the other guy goes, Hey, you know, I help finance the Dodgers. You want to go to Dodgers games? And yeah. And what I found in life is the moment you say yes, all these yeses open up. 1000%. Right. You know, and, and then one of the guys on the WhatsApp said, of course he shows up in New York. Why? Because last month there's a restaurant in Copenhagen called Noma. It was, it's been the number one rest, rated restaurant in the world with the number one chef in the world. And I got to go to that. And he announced he's closing his doors. No. At the end of this year. Wow. So me and Aaron, like, we have to go to Noma because I'm a foodie. Me too. So we tell a couple of our friends and one of them goes, I've got five seats for Thursday. Mm. And um, I moved to heaven and earth. And Aaron was ready in London. So we said, We'll be there. We show up no, on Tuesday. I fly to London and then we all get on a plane to fly to Copenhagen. This was like last week? It was like a month ago. Okay. <laughs> it's like, dude, you're like everywhere. I'm everywhere. No, no, that was last month. <laughs> yeah. And we flew to Copenhagen to have dinner at Noma. That was it. Yeah. And, uh, but no, <laughs> then all these things dominoed and we ended up eating at like four Michelin star restaurants in Europe. Oh man, you're talking and, my language. And you know, and the reason I'm sharing this is because people go, well, your life is so unfair or so this. And I'm going, yeah, you know why? It's because I say, yes, I have a reputation for yes. I got a text from a stranger 
saying, is this Urban McManus's phone number? I go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, I'm in a group of people. My brother has tickets to the finals of the World Cup in Rio de Janeiro. Um, no one in my group could go. They said, do you, and do you know anyone who could go? They said, there's this guy who writes books. I think he would go. He always says yes. And uh, <laughs> so I get this text from a guy going, do you want to go to the finals of the World Cup in Rio de Janeiro this a couple of years, years ago? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, it, it was Monday and the World Cup finals were that Sunday, I think it was. Okay. So I call my office. You got to get me a visa to Brazil. I cannot get a visa. Mm. So I call someone and they go, we got you. They call Germany. I get hired by FIFA to work on their marketing team for one weekend. <laughs> so I get an expedited visa through FIFA wow. to go to Brazil. I go to Brazil without a place to stay. Mm. I post on Instagram right before I board the plane to Rio de Janeiro. I'll be in Rio in the morning, have no place to stay. I get a text before I land going, would you come stay at our home? <laughs> our father's an atheist and we'd love for you to have breakfast and have a conversation about God. Wow. So they meet me at the airport. They drive me to their house. Dude, you're brave. <laughs> and uh, uh, not only did I have a wonderful conversation with their father who's an atheist, but their grandfather who was into um, a s s spirit worship where yeah. they would meet together and allow spirits to absorb their bodies. Wow. And they worship the dead. Wow. And so we have this incredible conversation. And then I get a call. Hey, we have a hotel across from the stadium. Do you want to come and stay here? And so I get to um, connect with Adidas. And I and I, now I have these premier seats as a FIBA employee <laughs> going to the after party with the German team. All these things happen. I want a reputation for yes. Yeah. I want a reputation for a person who always leans in and goes forward. And, and by the way, that's why I was able to slip into Damascus and go to the city with the highest concentration of assassins in the world, went across the border from, from Lebanon and Syria. And, you know, why- I didn't even know Damascus still exists. Yeah, it does. You know, wow. I went into Pakistan on the plane in English, they announced, uh, if you are in Pakistan and you proselyte, that is punishable by death. Mm. And they said that in English on the plane. Wow. I was the only person pretty much on the plane that spoke English. Like, we know what you do. And, uh, and you, when you lean in and have a life of yes, like my, my theory of life is you go until you get a no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a it. lot of people wait for a yes. Yeah. I assume God wants me to live fully. Yeah. And so if I get a no, then I stop. But, um, and, and to me, it's, it's exciting, you know. I mean, I've been to at least 70 countries around the world and people ask me, how did you develop a speaking career? You know how? After 9-11, no one would get on a plane, but I did. Mm. After, during Y2K, do you remember Y2K when they said the world's going to fall apart? Yep, yep. On Y2K, on the 30th, my family and I flew from LA to Philadelphia to speak at a convention. Mm. On the 31st, we flew from Philadelphia to Houston to speak at a convention. And on the 1st, we flew home back to LA. And I told him, I said, the world is living in fear because yeah. of Y2K. Yeah. Christians are paralyzed. It's horrible. I'm embarrassed. Yeah. So we're going to fly on Y2K. If, we, if we're wrong, we die. Yeah. We don't have to hear it from anyone. Yeah. But if we live, we'll be a, a statement. Yeah. We'll be proof of concept that you should live a life of faith without fear. Yeah. And my world opened up because a lot of people wouldn't say yes. Yeah. And I did. Yeah. The first time I ever spoke to more than 200 people, 20,000 people in a stadium. I was just volunteering backstage at the age of 29. And a guy comes up to me because the speaker didn't show up. And the other speaker was on a golf course. And this guy walks up to me and goes, Erwin, I think you're supposed to speak tonight. He had like 20 speakers waiting to be asked, but they were all in suits. And this 20,000 people were high school and college students. Yeah. And I'm there in blue jeans and tennis shoes. And, and, um, and so with 45 minutes notice, I get to speak to 20,000 people. Awesome. And it opened up the whole world to me. I think most of us, we're, we're like living in this parallel dimension and we choose the life of fear, but we're just a sliver away from a life of faith. Yeah. And if we could just move into the yes, we would experience such an extraordinary life. It would blow our minds away. Mm. No, I love it. I love where your heart's at. And 
man, being both foodies, we actually have to get to dinner <laughs> here soon. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up with the final question. This is a selfish question because I, I need to get the yes from you of what I should do. So going back to this idea of being the best, winning, compete, mm-hmm. what am I trying to say? Like what culture am I like? You tell me what, am, what, what, how do I speak what I'm trying to say? And what's the intention? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with the language of winning. You know, one of the people I coach is Sean McVay, the head coach of the Rams. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he's about winning. Youngest yeah. coach to ever win a Super Bowl. Yeah. And I, I, I think winning is a wonderful outcome. It's just not a great purpose. Your purpose for life should be rooted in who you are. So if your purpose is who you're becoming, it can't be shaken by wins or losses, failure or success. Yeah, you're, so, you're, you're in the process. Yeah, so you should want to win. You should want to be the best. These are great aspirations, but they should be outcomes of the person that you're committed to becoming. And so I don't want to diminish that language because I love sports. I, yeah. I love to win. And, you know, maybe even, I might even hate to lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you know? And, uh, but what drives people crazy is like, I, I play chess. I've been playing chess since I was three years old. I usually purposely lose my first three games to anyone I play with, no matter how bad they are. I want to give them a sense of confidence. I want to, you know, build a little momentum in the game. And I love watching how they play because I actually don't care if I lose in the short term, mm-hmm. if I can win in the long term. And here's what I would say is like, win the long game, win the game that matters. It's the game of life. Win by having a great marriage and raising great kids. Win by having a corporate culture where everyone feels valued. Mm -hmm. Just win the right game. Don't win the wrong game. So the message of winning, as long as you convey the game that you're playing. Yeah. Yeah. Win, but don't let other people pick the game for you. Yeah. I love it. You know, Orwin, dude, it's been great having you on. you know, I, I've learned a lot and you've accomplished your goal in being unique and <laughs> giving me things I have not considered. And so I'm very grateful for that and grateful for whatever we say yes to together. Um, and Ryan, I want things. you to know, I came not to be on your podcast. I came for the opportunity to get to know you and to build a friendship. I appreciate that. Same. So I know you got a bunch of stuff going on. You've got um, the arena, you've got your book, where, where can people find all that? And we also have a conference coming up October 6th and 7th there we in, go. in Los Angeles. And I'm going to try and say yes to the 7th. If you, you can, know. that'd be great. Yeah. And it's uh, the arena live in LA. Uh, just go to my uh, uh, erwinmcmanus.com. Okay. And you can learn about the arena, which is our online mastermind. And you can hopefully uh, pre-order my new book, Mind Shift. You don't have to be a genius to uh, think When's like that one. come out? October 3rd. Okay. So it's all All right right next to each other. Yeah, it's all right here. All right. We're going to get this podcast released early so we can get this all out. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, everyone, I appreciate you. Make sure you guys go check that out, erwinmcmanus.com, and make sure to subscribe. We'll see you later. Peace. I don't love all the work. I love meeting the next version of me. I love more self-discovery. I love expanding my being. I'm addicted to the expansion of me. You know, we're both baseball guys. And I remember making literally 